Okay, um, I guess it's seven o'clock, so we should probably get going on this. Um, I thank you all for coming tonight. Everybody's really interested in everything that's going on with this MSI and trying to figure out what, what, what's going to happen and what we want to do with it. So um, I bring this meeting to order right now at 7 o'clock. I'm sure we'll still have some folks moving in or coming along, but we should really get started on time. So I am just going to turn this right over to the representatives of the Massachusetts Shellfish Initiative. Um, and I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves and explain who they are and who they represent. And then Melissa, I believe, is going to give us um, a slideshow. And then we're going to have plenty of time for questions and answers. OK, so let's get this, this going. Hi, I'm Steve Kirk. I work for the Nature Conservancy. I'm Melissa Sanderson. I work for the Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance. Hi, good evening. My name is Scott Soares. I have my own company, Boston Bay Consulting, and I'm working as a consultant with both the Mass Aquaculture Association as well as the Mass Shellfish Initiative. Hi, I'm Chris Scalacci. I work with the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, and I'm one of the DMF staff members who are working with Dr. Pierce to represent the division on the task force. All right, with that, I'll get started. Can, is this a good, I, I, everybody can hear me? Is, is it too light in here? Can everybody see that screen fine and hear Melissa? Yeah, this light, bank of lights can get shut off, probably. Let's see if we can. Thanks, Chris. I can pull that a little closer, is that good? There, that's All good. All right. So the Massachusetts Shellfish Initiative, or as I'll refer to it as MSI tonight, is a project of the Fishermen's Alliance, the Nature Conservancy, and the Mass Aquaculture Association in partnership with the Division of Marine Fisheries, UMass Boston, and the Governor's Office by way of Secretary Beaton. Uh, before I talk about MSI um, and our role in it, in the interest of transparency, I want to be clear that I'm here representing the Fishermen's Alliance in our role as a member of the MSI Task Force. We've heard a lot of rumors about MSI and the Alliance swirling around the Cape over the last few weeks. So in full disclosure and transparency, the Alliance is a member of the MSI Task Force, a member of the MSI Steering Committee and the MSI Assessment Committee, an investor in the ARC Hatchery, and we have two board seats with that company. Our industry members include wild shellfish harvesters and aquaculturists, along with a diversity of federal and state fisheries and gear types. We have staff appointments to the New England Fishery Management Council, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, and the Mass Fisheries Commission. Our CEO sits on the board of the Blue Economy Foundation, and our organization owns and leases groundfish and scallop quota at discounted rates to maintain access for Cape Cod fishermen. Started as the Cape Cod Commercial Hook Fishermen's Association over 25 years ago, our organization is a nonprofit member driven organization established in 1996. We changed our name after expanding our efforts to work with a range of gear types and fisheries to better reflect who we are. Those fisheries include groundfish, monkfish, skate, scallop, lobster, conch, bluefish, striped bass, tuna, dogfish, oysters, and quahogs. And our goal is to make sure that fishermen and fish, that the Cape Cod continues to have fishermen and fish for them to catch now and in the future by balancing the needs of both businesses and conservation of our shared resources. Our staff pay attention to current regulations and future challenges to our fisheries. Excuse me. We pay attention to proposed federal and state regulations and to new science and market changes. We act as a watchdog for our members, allowing them to spend more time fishing and less time navigating fisheries management. We bring fishermen together to advocate for solutions that work for their businesses through policy campaigns at the federal and state fisheries level. We work with fishermen on the water to do research so we have better science informing management. We hold fishing permits in trust for the community, providing discounted quota to current and future fishermen. And we elevate the profile and importance of fishermen across the Cape to increase support for our maritime heritage. So why is the Fishermen's Alliance getting involved in shellfish and MSI in particularly? 
We're part of MSI because we believe several key things. That shellfish is a critical piece of the Cape's blue economy that should be celebrated and supported, and that's both wild and commercial, or wild and recreational and commercial and farmed. Wild harvest of shellfish is at the core of the Cape's maritime traditions and should not be jeopardized for the sake of increased aquaculture. Recent growth of the shellfish industry and any future growth requires corresponding resources at the state and town level to support things like water quality monitoring, constables, enforcement, and nitrogen and shellfish research. There should be, ooh, let's go, there we go. There should be input from shellfish harvesters to create guidelines for future oyster reef restoration and nitrogen mitigation projects. We believe that the shellfish community would benefit from public outreach activities to raise shellfish awareness and support across the state. And we believe that bringing opposing sides together for discussion is the best way to identify and advance solutions to common problems. I will reiterate, as I did in East Ham, that the Fishermen's Alliance does not yet have policy positions related to nearshore shellfish beyond our opposition of the petite quahogs a few years ago. And the Fishermen's Alliance has not taken a position on Mass Aquaculture Association's proposed legislation to allow for the transfer or sale of aquaculture leases. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn the, the presentation over just for a moment to each of the organizations to talk about why they are part of MSI, and then I'll get into the nuts and bolts of where we are at. Yeah, again, I'm, uh, I'm Steve Kirk with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is a is a big conservation organization with uh, with representation in each of the 50 states and in 72 countries. They have a big mission to conserve lands and waters on which all life depends. It touches down a lot of different places in a lot of different ways. Um, here in Massachusetts, and the work that I've been working on is mostly related to shellfish restoration and the uh, environmental benefits of having shellfish in the water and, and uh, maintaining, oh, thanks, um, and maintaining um, native populations of, of shellfish in the water. And, you know, so we have implemented several small projects, uh, oyster reefs, mostly in Buzzards Bay towns, um, that have basically looked like putting shell material in the bottom, culching, and then planting uh, spat on shell on, on those reefs. They're small scale projects that, uh, that we've done thus far. We're, we're interested in seeing the Shellfish Initiative come together um, mostly to uh, to act as a forum for the different sectors to come together and find common ground in areas where we can potentially get more funding for uh, like people like Chris and his department, um, you know, for things like water quality monitoring, for, um, for things that uh, we think the different sectors have in common. And, um, you know, so what we hope to see the uh, shellfish initiative is this thing going? What we hope to do is um, through that, and as Mel had said, uh, referencing you know restoration practices that uh, we hope that there'll be an opportunity to figure out a way across the different sectors to come up with you know not necessarily a standardized cookbook, but um, but make sure that people have the ability to influence how, where, when, and why to do restoration activities and make sure that they're going in the right places and, and executed the right way. Um, you know, again, I think I'll reference the funding that I think that, uh, that uh, sort of unified voice across what the wild harvest sector, uh, growers, and, and people like me that are, are working for shellfish restoration that with a, with a common voice will be able to get more money out of the state and toward uh, things that, that we all hold in common. Um, I think that's, uh, that's about all I have for now. Where did I 
pressed the wrong button. Uh-oh. Thanks. Which one's advanced? That one. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to get them all up there. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Mass Aquaculture Association, I see a former president sitting right there in the audience. Uh, it's a nonprofit trade a group that was established way back in 1986 uh, for individuals and business, obviously those that were involved in aquaculture, not only shellfish growers, but finfish growers, as well as support organizations and businesses that were a part of uh, supporting the aquaculture industry, either directly or indirectly uh, with aquaculture in, in Massachusetts. Its purpose was to promote continued development of shellfish and finfish, far finfish farming uh, in Massachusetts and to improve conditions affecting aquaculture in Massachusetts across the broad spectrum, uh, not only on the regulatory side, but also relative to market development and research support. Uh, its goals were to represent the interests of Massachusetts aquatic farmers, uh, promoting high quality aquaculture products, growing a thriving aquaculture industry here in Massachusetts, uh, supporting the development and transfer of relevant technology, technology transfer uh, to the, and from the industry, and maintaining effective networks between industry, government, and researchers. And MAA believes that the strength between aquaculture industry, local and state government, is essential to aquaculture success uh, here in Massachusetts, which is in large part why uh, the industry has continued to grow as it has uh, here in the Commonwealth and certainly uh, down here on, on the Cape. So again, why uh, would be MAA, the Mass Aquaculture Association, be a part of or considered to be a part of and a partner in the Mass Shellfish Initiative? Uh, first of all, the Mass Aquaculture Association recognizes MSI, as you've heard, kind of a repeated theme, as a real forum to talk through a variety of issues uh, that have come up uh, over the years, going all the way back, to, in fact, in even 1986, uh, between the various resource uh, user, uh, users and, and the resource uh, resources re relative to shellfish. Now, as principal trade association for mass aquaculture businesses, uh, really like most of you here and the other groups here at the table, uh, the Aquaculture Association really felt like it had to be at the table to talk about these issues because it is directly related to shellfish. MAA seeks dialogue with the other resource user groups, which is, in, again, in large part why the association was a part of the initial request uh, to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation that you'll hear a little bit more about that provided the initial funding to kick off a Massachusetts shellfish initiative here in the Commonwealth. And MAA, like any organization uh, that represents its members, is concerned with tweaks, both good and bad, uh, to state policy including, and federal regulations as well that could have either negative or positive impacts uh, on the industry, on its continued growth, uh, or on uh, the inability for the industry to grow and prosper based on the existing uh, growers that already, already are licensed here in the Commonwealth. And lastly, uh, one of the biggest drivers, and some of you already may be aware of this, uh, that farmed oysters in particular now rank third on the list of all landed seafood here in Massachusetts at $28 million. That's behind sea scallops, uh, which is what makes New Bedford number one in the country for its value, uh, and lobster. So right now, uh, the value around farmed oysters ranks third on that list, which really puts a pretty significant economic impact uh, from the industry uh, here in Massachusetts, and particularly in places like Wellfleet, where there is so much aquaculture activity under, underway already. I don't have fancy slides, which may or may not be a good thing. We'll find out. So uh, the Division of Marine Fisheries uh, was asked to participate in the early scoping effort um, by the three groups here. We work with them all the time, and we looked at it as an opportunity to further gather stakeholder feedback um, and, and dialogue. And, you know, we really supported the move to a task force approach, and Secretary Beaton, um, the, who's the head of the Energy and Environmental Affairs, Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, really embraced it and encouraged EEA agencies to participate. But, you know, the reality is, is that we see some of the same emerging trends whether they be regulatory or environmental issues that these other groups see on the horizon. And they do have the potential to have a disruptive impact on the, the Commonwealth shell fisheries. And we want to be prepared to address those. And, you know, these groups continue to support that effort, have helped us in the past support that effort. And we found this to be, you know, an opportunity to continue that. Not the only opportunity that we pursue to gather stakeholder feedback, 
but it does provide one more forum where we can gather stakeholder feedback. You know, um, this is not from the division's perspective about telling municipalities or what you have to do, but it's just making sure that we have the tools so that we can address these emerging challenges. You know, clearly some adjustments need to be made to task force representation as we've seen, um, but this is an iterative process. The, this isn't a, a done deal and I'm here to hear some of that so that when we go to our next task force meeting, as an agency, we understand what needs to be done to bolster and make this a more meaningful process. You know, we are vigilant. We don't come into this with the expectation that anybody on this task force is unbiased. Um, you know, we have our own statutory mission and strategic plans. We have our own constituents' needs. We want to hear other people's constituents' needs and strategic plans and bring our needs and our, those of our constituents to the table. Um, you know, we often receive unfunded mandates, whether it be through bills or, you know, interest in things from the industry and, and we embrace the opportunity to sit at the table and discuss these things and talk about what resources we'll need to meet these challenges and to do some of the things that that the industry municipalities need to move forward and to, to secure the way of life that clearly you all are very invested in and, and that's you know why you're here. Um, this will not change the way we make policy or regulation like I said, this is just one effort of many that we participate in to gather stakeholder feedback. We see real value in having all of the EEA agencies at the table because, you know, while we have our shellfish advisory panel, while we have an Atlantic States, or while we have a Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission, we want to use every opportunity. And we hear a lot from these groups. They're well represented on these boards. We want to hear from you. And, you know, we do believe that this is a good forum, one in many, to do that. Um, I will say that part of the reason why we've embraced this, why we've offered to be the chair of, or to, to have a chair on the assessment committee, to be on the steering committee, is because, you know, we do want to make sure that this is a transparent process. We don't, you know, we want to, we want to make this meaningful. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, from a state agency perspective, we're going to put our money where our mouth is and participate and, you know, really try to listen to what you folks have to say. This, again, this isn't changing the way we make regulation or policy. Um, you know, you have Senate, Senate and House leadership on this task force with us, EE agency leadership on this task force with us. We all review, look at policy. We know good policy. We know bad policy. Um, you know, we're not, we're not blind to, you know, different groups' interests. But we brought this task force together because it's diverse in affiliation. There's no point in sitting at a table and listening to, you know, ourselves talk. We want to hear other people's opinions. I realize, our agency realizes there's a lot of concern around MSI, and particularly in Wellfleet and on the Lower Cape. It's not lost on us. Um, you know, ideally, we could turn this into, this energy into something positive. Um, and I think I'll leave it there. All right, so the question of do we need a shellfish initiative began in late 2016. In order to answer this question, the initial project partners of the Fishermen's Alliance, MAA, and TNC convened through the UMass Boston Environmental Innovation Clinic in 2017. And this allowed us to have a group of PhD students help us create a survey, and they hosted seven listening sessions and collected responses from 389 shellfish stakeholders to identify trends and issues, concerns and interest, and to confirm support for the MSI concept. This survey ran for several months and the results were ready in the fall of 2017. And the full report is available online. At that point, all of our effort had been volunteer and we started looking for funding to support a longer term effort. Despite knowing how challenging discussions around shellfish would be, we applied for and were awarded a two-year grant of $100,000 to support convening of meetings, gathering input, and documenting the process and writing the strategic plan. The grant funds allowed us to hire a consultant to staff the MSI process, Scott, and he's responsible for the heavy lifting on organizing and documenting meetings. Additionally, the TNC, the Alliance, DMF, UMass, Boston, and Island Creek Oyster are donating staff time worth 133,000 to the initiative. We spent several months in 2018 figuring out what the MSI process would look like and recruiting task force members, and then a few more months trying to find a date that worked for the first meeting. 
Despite the long delay between survey and the launch of the MSI last month, nothing has been, been defined for MSI beyond the overarching goal and the objectives to do two things. The first is building capacity for shellfish. And that, to me and to us, means increasing all of your participation in these types of efforts, whether it be community planning or the policy and regulatory process, and improving how we work together and share information. The second objective is to develop a statewide strategic plan and guidance document for how we're going to balance growing demands for our shellfish resources. And I, I've realized over the last month in having conversations that the word recommendations is a loaded term in the shellfish world. Um, when your board makes shellfish recommendations, they become new rules. When we make, when the MSI makes shellfish recommendations, it's a document that may or may not be implemented. And we're all going to put a lot of time into it, so we hope it will be implemented. But at the end of the day, as Chris said, we're not a regulatory body. We can't change the rules. We're going to put together a document that hopefully advances the interests for shellfish and improves things. But it's up to the communities and the state and the nonprofits and the towns to take that document and do something with it after it's done. So I mentioned that MSI has a goal. Um, it is to maximize the economic, environmental, and social benefits of Massachusetts nearshore shellfish resources. And maximize doesn't necessarily mean growth. It means making informed and thoughtful decisions about balancing these competing demands for shellfish resources across our coastal communities. Um, at MSI, just to be clear, we're talking about nearshore state and town, nearshore state and town regulated shellfish resources and resource areas, wild harvest, habitat restoration, aquaculture. So these are your oysters, quahog, steamers, mussels, bay clams, uh, sorry, bay scallops, razor clams, and surf clams. We're not talking about sea scallop or things that are regulated by the federal government. Also, um, MSI is an opportunity for user groups to come together to have discussions to propose and refine solutions. And MSI, as I've mentioned, hopes to balance growing demands among restoration, nitrogen mitigation, aquaculture, and wild harvests, and finding consensus and a path forward. As Chris mentioned, MSI is not a regulatory body. It cannot change the regulations. And lastly, the MSI is meant to enhance shellfish opportunities for all user groups, including town programs, aquaculturists, wild commercial harvesters, recreational harvesters, and the restoration community. So why are we doing this now? There are several important challenges that have been identified now is the right time for MSI to bring stakeholders together. There's increased demand for more statewide monitoring due to increased frequency of closures. We have complex and sometimes redundant permitting. There's proposed state and federal legislation associated with shellfish. Uh, recently, uh, there was a, a federal proposal by Senator Wicker for the Advancing the Quality and Understanding of American Aquaculture Act. In, so oops, sorry. in some cases, legislation is appropriate. In others, a more public process to make regulation change would be better. For example, in 2016, there was a proposed bill at the state that would fast track restoration permitting and limit public comment. A large group of stakeholders and agencies met to discuss it and decided a more organic planning process would be better than allowing special group interest groups to push forward legislation. As we all know, demand for shellfish resources is high, both for actual shellfish and for the ocean bottom it inhabits, creating potential conflicts among waterfront homeowners, boaters, beachgoers, and shellfish businesses. Many towns have a wait list for residents interested in receiving a lease to start aquaculture business. In 2016, a survey of all the Cape towns showed a wait list of 178 people. And at that point, there were 278 aquaculture licenses on Cape Cod. Towns are turning to shellfish to clean up their estuaries and mitigate nitrogen problems. Barnesville County's two, Section 208 Water Quality Monitoring Plan includes shellfish as a strategy to restore embayment water quality. The towns of Mashpee and Falmouth have plans to annually grow and harvest a lot of shellfish, and Orleans is considering doing the same. As Steve mentioned, restoration advocates are actively trying to increase the amount of restored oyster reefs in the state. 
And more shellfish in the water means more opportunity to spread shellfish disease, which means we need more shellfish research and lab capacity. As you all know, the shellfish industry has grown rapidly in the last two decades with minimal plan for how to sustain that growth. There are now over 3,000 commercial permit holders and wild, harvest, wild commercial harvest and aquaculture shellfish landings, landings represent um, over 45 million annually to fishermen and growers. Uh, growers have reported 2018 had lower prices than previous year and it is predicted that future growth could soften prices further if demand does not increase. And that predicted future growth could come from many areas, two of which are these, these shellfish being grown by the towns for their nitrogen projects. And as you all know, New Bedford has proposed to open up several thousand acres to aquaculture. And we've seen a, this growing perception of a divide between wild harvesters, farmers, restoration, and the town, mit nitrogen mitigation programs. Lastly, NOAA is encouraging states to develop a shellfish initiative. And with one, Massachusetts will be more competitive in securing federal funds to support shellfish. Aquaculture is one of the fastest growing food sectors in the country, and NOAA is committed to expanding U.S. marine aquaculture production by volume by at least 50% by 2020. While most of that expansion is targeted at finfish, shellfish will also be impacted by NOAA's investment. For example, NOAA is awarding $800,000 in shellfish research grants this summer to two, two, two collaborative consortia of stakeholders and researchers on the East Coast. Um, so people are applying for this right now. Funders want to see widespread collab collaboration across your state or across the region, not niche projects for a single town. Currently, there are eight shellfish initiatives across the country, and it is important to note that Massachusetts will be unique as we're the only one with home rule. From that survey that I mentioned earlier in 2017, um, we also found some things that led us to believe that now was the right time for the MSI. More than 50% of participants surveyed believe that a grassroots, grassroots approach to creating a statewide plan has the potential to increase shellfish resources in the Commonwealth, raise visibility and status of shellfish for the broad benefits they contribute, increase the credibility, cooperation, communication, and coordination among stakeholders, leverage support from other sectors, and update and provide for comprehensive management for shellfish resources. Additionally, 77% of respondents are concerned with water quality, 71% support more funding for DMF to expand water quality monitoring, 62% support expanded propagation programs, 25% support additional field monitoring of shellfish disease and harmful algal blooms, 53% believe there should be more shellfish industry training, 73% support expanding shellfish hatcheries in the state, and 50% support mentoring of newly appointed grant holders. Additionally, of the 389 people that took the survey, 72 were general public and were not affiliated with shellfish in any way, and that more than 70% of them supported expanding shellfish resources for both harvest and restoration, the use of shellfish to improve water quality in their towns, and dedicating more resources to cleaning up our waters in order to open more clo currently closed areas to shellfishing. Um, Chris and I both mentioned the task force earlier. In order to have a strong process for collecting a diverse range of input and to have the political support necessary to implement the strategic plan, a task force was assembled by the Alliance, the Nature Conservancy, Mass Aquaculture Association, in partnership with the Governor's Office and DMF. This task force is responsible for the following, to shape and guide the MSI process, to identify, appoint, and oversee any MSI committees, to convey MSI information and opportunities to participate to the shellfish community to ensure broad and equitable representation, to the extent practicable, see that the MSI serves as a common resource for proposed and existing private, town, and state shellfish-related activities, to refine and and finalize strategic plan and recommendations, and to utilize their networks and relationships to advance MSI goals and recommendations. 
And it's important to note that when we created the task force, the control and decision making for MSI went from our three organizations to this 19 member task force. So when, we, when you guys are asking for things, we can't make it happen immediately. It has to go back to the task force for approval. The task force is composed currently of 19 members. Uh, they're all listed here. This list is also on our website. They include the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs, Woods Hole Sea Grant, the towns represented by Chatham, Duxbury, Gloucester, and New Bedford. And I'll pause for a moment there. I know that's one of the controversial issues surrounding MSI. Those four towns were selected because it's, it would be unwieldy and unrealistic to have a representative from every town on the task force. There's 50, 57, 53, 57 coastal communities. Um, and we are picking one from each geographic area, so the North Shore, the South Shore, the South Coast, and the Cape. And we were looking for a range of interest in, sh in shellfish in those communities. So Duxbury is very pro-aquaculture, Chatham is very pro-wild harvest. Gloucester has a little bit of shellfish going on, but is fairly ambivalent. And New Bedford would like to do a lot of, of aquaculture, but isn't there yet. So we have a, a range of, of viewpoints and where they're coming from. And those towns aren't supposed to just represent themselves. They're supposed to represent all mu municipalities um, and be communicating with other towns. Additionally, uh, we have all the state agencies that touch shellfish, the Division of Marine Fisheries, the Environmental Law Enforcement, Department of Public Health, Mass Environmental Policy Act Office, Coastal Zone Management, the Department of Ag Resources, and Department of Environmental Protection, Senators Vin Senator Vinnie DeMacito and Representative Sarah Peake, and then a representative from each of the three founding organizations, TNC, MAA, and the Fishermen's Alliance. Oh, and MSOA, thank you. Uh, so the Shellfish Constables Association also has a seat at the table. Some of these members are serving themselves and others are sending designees. And I'll reiterate what I committed in East Ham, which is that the Fishermen's Alliance will be asking the task force to add an additional member, likely from Wellfleet, to represent the Outer Cape shell fishermen that feel under underrepresented. <coughs> I believe everybody else at this table will also be recommending that, but I'll let them speak to that. So the first meeting of the task force was on January 2nd of this year. At that meeting, they did not determine objectives or what issues the MSI would take up. And they did not yet finalize the MSI process, but they are committed to focusing on shellfish community input. At that meeting, they determined that the, that the MSI needs more research and input on the current state of shellfish, so resources and challenges and needs. They did create two committees, the assessment committee to complete research and report back to the task force, comprised of task force appointees and volunteers, and a steering committee to organize meetings and take direction from the tax, task force. There were draft strawman committees that were proposed prior to the task force meeting, and at its first meeting, the task force scrapped those committees and only created these two committees. Um, it is likely that the task force will create future committees, but they do not yet exist. So the steering committee um, is responsible for organizing meetings, taking direction from the task force, and working with the chairs to maintain momentum between task force meetings. Task force members were asked to volunteer at the January 2nd meeting to be on this committee. And the members are Chris, myself, Chris Sherman from Mass Aquaculture Association, and Steve Kirk from the TNC. Uh, and we are supported by Scott and an uh, intern from UMass Boston, uh, Sean McNally. The assessment committee is responsible for developing a situational analysis that will be completed, well, hopefully by April 3rd, although at this point I think we're, we're tacking some time onto that, and we'll, is supposed to include the following. An assessment of the capacity and the status of state and town government and NGO support and programming for shellfish, including but not limited to current staffing, labs, hatcheries, research, monitoring, education, outreach, town programs, and economic impacts of shellfish in Massachusetts. An assessment of the status of existing strategic goals related to shellfish across state agencies, nonprofit organizations, and towns. 
and a compilation of public input that has been collected through surveys and agency requests associated with shellfish, as well as informal feedback gathered by the committee. Here's a list of committee members. Uh, they represent a range of folks. Uh, Wellfleet is well represented there. Uh, you have Jeff Kennedy from DMF, who's chairing the committee. Brent, I, and I apologize if I scramble any names. Brent Valley, Chris Manula, Dan Morton, Diane Murphy, Ed Anthus Washburn, Ginny Parker, Lindsay Williams, Liz Lewis, Mark Begley, myself, Michelle Inslee, Nancy Chavetta, Nate Davis, Renee Gagney, Ron Bergstrom, Steve Kirk, Phil Phillips, and Todd Callahan. This list is also available on our website. So where are we at right now? From January to April, the committee is supposed to be doing this assessment and report, uh, researching and doing initial community outreach. Uh, they are surveying towns through the constables and shellfish committees and boards, and surveying, they, the committee suggested that we also resurvey all commercial harvesters, and that will be done at a later date, but they are committed to doing that. Um, the committee will provide, provide data back to the task force, and sometime in April, it was supposed to be April 3rd, we're looking like we're moving that in order to accommodate schedules. Uh, the task force will be meeting again, and the draft agenda is to review the results of the assessment committee to determine the next steps for the MSI process, possibly to draft MSI objectives if we feel, if the task force feels like it knows enough at that point, and to possibly create additional committee committees comprised of stakeholders. After April, the process will be further defined by the task force. I can assure you there will be ample opportunity for public conversation, input, and comment over the next year. As Chris mentioned, MSI is not a government entity and is not bound by open meeting law. And ooh, there you go. And in the interest of transparency, MSI public hearings will follow the state's public meeting notification and minutes requirements. And the calendar and documents are available online. I'm gonna run through a small selection of the challenges, challenges and issues that folks have asked MSI to consider addressing. Final MSI objectives will be driven by your input and selected by the task force. So some examples that we've heard from state, towns, shell fishermen, organizations, and the public. Guidelines for restoration and nitrogen mitigation projects. Education and outreach to increase community support for shellfish. Solutions for maintaining and, maintaining and increasing demand for shellfish. Reducing interagency regulatory conflicts. Maintaining healthy ecosystems while allowing for growth. Identifying resources necessary to accommodate growing demands for monitoring, permitting, propagation, shoreside infrastructure, and dredging, i.e. funds for CMAC, DMF, and the towns, real-time monitoring of preemptive storm closures to limit economic impact, codifying existing aquaculture permit conditions and to regulation, DMF's Massachusetts Aquaculture Permitting Plan and Special Review Procedure, and Mass Aquacultures Association's proposal to allow for the transfer or sale of shellfish leases. MSI, regardless of what objectives are chosen and what solutions are recommended, we hope that MSI will do several things. Provide the agreement across user groups that is needed to promote the environmental, economic, and cultural importance of shellfish. Provide credibility to existing and future shellfish projects to earn funding and or community support improve communications and relationships among user groups, provide user-driven recommendations for possible future shellfish policy, regulation, or legislative changes, build a foundation to support the growth that has already occurred, and provide a framework for how to handle any increasing shellfish supply in the state. So what, the, what I've been requesting from each town as I've been making these presentations is that the town shares what they consider their top three most critical challenges related to shell fishing, as well as the top three recommendations for how the MSI could improve your shellfish resources. Once the survey to the towns from the assessment committee is ready, we will share that with your constable and shellfish advisory board, and hopefully they'll be able to fill that out, and that should be pretty straightforward data. 
Um, if your town chooses to identify additional volunteers that want to serve on future committees, uh, please submit their names and contact information to us. And obviously, if you have additional input concerns, uh, you can contact MSI directly, and I'll, the next slide will give you some uh, uh, email addresses and whatnot. And there'll be additional opportunities in the coming months for providing formal input. Um, beyond the town providing information, um, everybody that's interested in shellfish is encouraged to participate. You can sign up for updates and meeting notices. We'll email that to you. Uh, you can attend public meetings. You can provide written comment. Uh, you can volunteer for a committee. And you can obviously email your input suggestions, concerns, and questions to massshellfishinitiative at gmail.com. And that is the end of my presentation. And unless these guys have anything to add, we'll open it up to questions. Before we get into, qu I just wanted to make one clarification that DMF is on the steering committee. Right now I'm serving for Director Pierce on the steering committee, but other, everything I do on the steering committee is done through DMF. Um, so it's DMF on there. Um, and then DMF has also committed to, for any committee meetings or any task force meetings, to use our DMF listserv to post notice of those meetings um, just to further bolster participation. Okay, well, I thank you all for um, all the information you've provided us. Um, I'm wondering, does anyone here on our board have, want to open up with some questions? Or should I just open it right up to? Uh, I'd like to say something. Okay. <laughs> anyway, how you doing? My name is Brett Morse, and uh, I've been a commercial wild shell fisherman for 40 years. And um, I kind of see a bad moon arising with you guys. And the reason is, is because, um, like, I don't think I personally would, uh, like I read some of the articles in the paper and one of the articles, it, it seemed like a lot of propag propaganda to me about how wonderful it'll be to clean the water. And, uh, and there was a picture of a young man counting razor clams and, and you're doing a survey on the amount of razor clams and how wonderful that is. I instantly was like, how many razor clams show on a given tide, 30%, maybe 70%, maybe 100% that day. You know, you'll never be able to count razor clams or keep them contained because they move across the bottom underneath the sand. They move sideways and they go away and they go wherever they want to go. But um, also, it seems to me, um, like on the map of uh, the Cape and the South Shore, there was red marks. Do you know what those meant? Were they areas of potential propagation? No, those were prohibited areas, correct? Yeah, prohibited? That, was the, that was the map of classification areas and that yeah. showed the prohibited areas. Um, I also have concern about, say all these hundreds of acres come online in New Bedford. Are these contaminated shellfish when they come out of these beds? Yes. Good question. No. OK. Uh, the next question, let me finish. Um, the question. What happens to those shellfish once they're done? Like, is someone getting paid to um, buy the shellfish? Like, do the communities pay for the shellfish to clean their water? And then do they go from there to? some bottom where Island Creek has purchased bottom in Falmouth, and then they get sold back to Island Creek after. I'm just wondering about the cycle of where these shellfish are going. You're specifically asking about the town nitrogen projects? Yeah, I'm saying there's probably more nitrogen projects to come. Can you just yeah. clarify, you had mentioned New Bedford and asked if they were contaminated in New Bedford. I meant like the Taunton River. Okay, so you're talking about the contaminated relays, the Quahog program. Yeah. Sure, so the Quahog program, which is managed by the Division of Marine Fisheries, the division manages shellfish resources in contaminated areas, with the exception of conditionally approved areas in the closed status where there is a municipal management plan. 
Um, so the Taunton River, we maintain a COOG relay program where municipalities on the Cape and the South Coast receive those COHOGs um, and then they go into recreational commercial fisheries. They have to stay where they're planted for a year and a half. They have to spawn and then um, they're able to harvest them. There's some situations where they don't need to be there quite as long, but in general, it's a broodstock enhancement program and it's, it's, it's essentially supporting recreational commercial fisheries in some South Coast communities. But those are wa all wild harvested. None of them end up on aquaculture sites. We don't allow contaminated relays for private aquaculture. Uh, I'm Dave Seitler. Um, I wanted to say uh, thanks for explaining the recommendations. Um, that it's a good clarity. Um, that I was worried about that, so thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, also thanks for um, you know changing the uh, open meeting law part of this, um, and uh, or, or complying with the open meeting law, so that you know people. It, it's cool, you know. Um, and I appreciate it. I'm sure everybody here does too. Um, and um, I thank you for putting us on the task force too. Um, or make, or for all of you guys making recommendations for being on the task force, it's cool. And um, I'm sure you guys know everything that we've, I've been like writing about and stuff. And uh, I think I should make like a apology to you guys just in case I, um, you know, haven't been, I'm not, this is my first time doing this, you know what I mean? And uh, I'm not good at it. And so I'm just, I'm trying, you know what I mean? So um, I guess my first question to you guys would be, uh, what does uh, MSI do for me as like an individual? Like specifically for me or any one of these guys? Well, I'll, I'll take a whack at it first. I think first and foremost, it, it gives you a voice at the table for what recommendations could be considered that would improve any challenges that you see from whatever perspective you're coming at it, from wild harvester, recreational harvester, member of a town shellfish advisory board, whatever the perspective is. Uh, one of the earlier presentations, in fact, the presentation that was given to the task force uh, referenced, and I believe it's up online now, referenced an effort that was done back in 1995 called the Aquaculture White Paper and Strategic Plan. That was a process that I know some folks in the room were a part of, but unlike this process, it was very isolated and really controlled more, more than anything by the state agencies. There was very little public outreach as a part of that effort. Although there were some recommendations that came from that that ended up getting implemented, very few of them were. So the hope with this process is not only to be broader than just aquaculture, but also to look at how do we capture, as a grassroots effort, comment from the folks who are really in the ground doing the work with shellfish. And again, whether it's restoration work that we're seeing more of, whether it's growth in recreational or commercial harvest that we're seeing more of, or certainly where there's growth in aquaculture, that we, again, that we're seeing more of that. So to get all of that input in one place so that recommendations can be put forward, that ultimately, if any of those are supported, then they could improve and are designed to improve the, the, whole, uh, the whole spectrum for everybody involved in shellfish. So as one of the stakeholders in that range of folks involved in shellfish, it's intended to help you, give you a voice to get your recommendations put forward to help improve any challenges that you may have seen or may see in the future. Anybody else wants to add? Couldn't we do that on our own right now? I will say from the agency perspective, we don't often hold public hearings for emerging problems. <laughs> you know, often by the time we're seeking your public input, we've drafted a set of regulations or a policy. And so I'm really encouraged to see, um, this is me personally speaking, state agencies looking for your feedback and providing a venue for it. Um, you know, I, I think we as an agency have seen some of these emerging challenges and we've, we've, we've made note of them, but you know, they haven't gone anywhere. If we look at, we have disease issues and last year the funding for the only disease monitoring program in the state went away. Um, you know, these are things that as an agency, we haven't had much luck individually getting you know that mass critical support for and so in some ways we're looking for you to reaffirm what we already know as an agency that these are important to you um, and I, you know I don't see a million opportunities for for folks to do that right now 
um, beyond, you know, there, there, there truly aren't a lot of opportunities to talk about emerging challenges out there in a formal setting. And I, and I think I'll also add that, and it's been said over and over again, you all know this better than I do, Wellfleet's a unique place. And it's unique, especially when it comes to shellfish, again, across that broad spectrum. So the MSI is not intended in any way to discount what you already have done or are doing successfully here in Wellfleet. But there are, as was cited, 57 other coastal communities in this state, and every one of these communities, including the 351 across the state, are all competing for resources in various ways. So what it does is it adds to your voice and the, the issues that you're already putting forward and helps strengthen uh, the situation for shellfish up and down the coast, not just in Wellfleet. And again, based on the success that you've already seen in places like Wellfleet, but it, it helps add to the voice that you already have such a strong voice already in this community around shellfish. Thanks. Um, I was wondering, could you go back to the slide, Melissa, that on the bottom of it, it talked about um, do, 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 I talked about up right there. Um, it talked about the Mass Aquaculture Association's proposal to allow for statewide um, transfer, transferability of shellfish leases. Um, there's there's things like that that really need to come out in the open and be discussed. Um, and I'm glad to see that up there now. I think that the presentation has greatly changed from the first presentation I've seen and has become more inclusive. Um, I'm wondering about that $800,000 you talked about in grant money that's out there. Would MSI be part of securing any of those funds or looking into the, the committees and putting that money where we need it? like? for more monitoring for the DMF and more more money for Roxanne and more money to figure out these shellfish diseases and yep um, I right now the MSI is not in a position to apply for it because we don't have anything yet right but if there are future opportunities like that part of what I would hope comes out of that strategic plan is identifying how we're going to get it done and that includes identifying opportunities to apply for pots of money like that okay in particular I think when someone like Roxanne Smolowitz is applying for NROC money if she can specifically point to a shellfish initiative that says that this is a huge priority for shellfish in Massachusetts if, if that if that all if that's all this becomes it's still important in the sense that we can speak with a broader voice than just Roxanne Smolowitz wants to collect clams to figure out if they have neoplasia. Mm -hmm. Right. What's the NROC? NROC is the Northeast Regional Aquaculture Center. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I'll, I'll give you another example. On the, on the terrestrial food side, there was an effort in Massachusetts a few years back to put together a, 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 a food policy council, legislatively driven food policy council. Uh, admittedly, and I think it was uh, a short-sighted of the group, it didn't include much in the way of fisheries. Fisheries were in there, but not much. But that report, the point I'm making is because that report came out and it recommended things like food hubs, creating food hubs, there was funding that came from the USDA Rural Development, multi-millions of dollars, that led to funding in this state to put those projects together that would not have happened had it not been for the report that identified those as important things for the food system in the state. Similarly, a report that identifies any number of important aspects around shellfish, shellfish improvement, and again, across the broad spectrum, can likewise leverage funding through places not only like the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation that funding has already been received from, but through these large-scale federal grants like the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission programs that are out there, the $800,000 grant that you, that you cited. But that's just one example of a lot of other federal money and other agency money, other institutional money that's out there that once you have, as Chris was saying, a broad community speaking in favor of specific recommendations, then ultimately the funding can flow and help support those kinds of activities. Thank you. Um, does anyone else on the board want to speak? Or uh, have a, quite another question? I do. Oh, Dave. Um, I have a lot of questions, so. Could, um, can everybody hear Dave? Is he speaking up? Yep, good. Uh, um, so this one was for Steve Kirk. Um, why, so why do we need re reef restoration? Where is it happening? And um, why do 
I want that, I guess, in Wellfleet, I, I would understand why other people in the state would want it, but why would I want that? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not sure if you do want that, and if you don't, uh, I'm not in a position to try and compel you to do that. You know, so I've worked with, with other towns that have uh, been able to source funding and the Nature Conservancy has done a lot of shellfish restoration outside of Massachusetts, like in the Chesapeake Bay or in southeastern Mass and, and or southeastern U.S. and Gulf of Mexico. And so, you know, colleagues of mine have a lot of experience with that outside of Massachusetts. And so some towns have reached out to us to support them in doing reef restoration projects. And so I've been able to provide them with some technical transfer, as, as Scott was mentioning earlier, and, uh, and some money to do that. So, you know, as related to MSI, you know, I, the Nature Conservancy isn't interested in trying to um, dedicate all of Massachusetts waters to restoration only. We're interested in advancing, uh, you know, well-sited and well-built restoration projects that the community supports. So, um, if you or the or you know others in in Wellfleet don't see the value or are actively seeking that kind of work or that type of project, then. That, then there's no, then that's fine. Um, I was wondering, what was the process MAA used to vote on to get involved with the MSI? The process that was, uh, sorry, ask the question again? Yeah, um, what was the process MAA used to vote on, on getting into getting involved with MSI, or how did the MAA kind of get into this. Yep. Uh, well, my understanding, and it happened prior to my coming on as a consultant to work with MAA or with the MSI, was that a discussion was had between TNC, Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance, and then President Chris Sherman with the MAA. And this discussion, as I mentioned in the, in the overview, the reason MAA was at the table is because they really had to be at the table. Ultimately, it was about shellfish, and if there was about shellfish and MAA wasn't at the table, there was, the organization wasn't doing what its job was to represent the growers. So that's how I understand it came about. Does that answer your question? Um, I think I asked what was the process they used um, to, like, so when it was, uh, when it was proposed to the, the voting members of MAA, how did? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that question. That okay. was prior to my, my time. I, it may have been, and I'm just speculating at this point, a meeting of the trustees that it may have been, but I'm, I'm speculating at this point, so I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Um, do you guys want to ask any more questions? Um, to these guys? Yeah, I have one question. How does Island Creek shellfish fit into this situation with the people on your board there? So when the, the MSI was conceptualized, Chris Sherman, who's the president of Island Creek, was the president of Mass Aquaculture Association. Um, and when I mentioned that they were donating time to the project, it's Chris's time for participating in this. Um, beyond that, there's, you would have to ask Chris, but that's, that is the connection between Island Creek and MSI. And um, I believe that Chris will continue to represent MAA at the MSI table. Um, I was, some of these questions are just like really, they're, they're tough to, questions to ask and um, I, don't, I don't mean them to be like offensive in any way, but I feel like everybody here wants to know, you know, and, and you know, if we can, um, so, I think this is kind of at, like going off of what Chip was saying, you know, it's, it, is it a perceived conflict of interest that Scott is representing the MAA, the MSI, as well as consulting for Island Creek Oysters? 
and your company, Hingeline, uses Island Creek Oysters as a supplier, and Chris Sherman is president of Island Creek and was president of, MS, of MAA and on the MSI steering committee. You want me to answer if that's a conflict? I don't see it as a conflict, no. Okay. <laughs> and in large part, you know, I'll, let, me, let, me, let me back up and say that what you've put together there in your question yeah. are, includes a lot of speculation around what Hinge Line is, uh, which is not even a formative company at this point. We're just coming together. Cool. It's separate, and we've had we've met with Island Creek early on as one of the leaders, and I would ask if anyone disagrees with that in this room, as one of the leaders in the aquaculture space here in Massachusetts and now in other states as well. So they were a consulting advisor for the work that I was doing, again, as a consultant with another business that I was putting together that's still formative. Any of the work that's done here with MSI and MAA, as is evidenced by our being here tonight, is done to be completely transparent. I'm recording secretary for this stuff. That's my job for this. None of my recommendations are coming forward. I'm not even making any recommendations where this goes. Any of the recommendations around MSI or anything else related to this, even for the MAA for that matter, comes from the membership of the MAA, where I'm working as a de facto executive director for them, as a consultant, or as a recording secretary from MSI. It's coming from you all as the group. So for anyone to hold against me after 20 plus years of working for the state and working for federal agencies and prior to that being in the military that I, now there's a conflict because I have a vast experience and I've developed my own business. I would ask anyone else who's developed their business if they're not also engaged in activities that might be perceived as a conflict. Thanks, appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, how come with all the legislative bodies, private NGOs, grant money all in one group right now at this moment, we aren't being more proactive about reducing nitrogen at its source like fertilizer, septic runoff, instead of being reactive and going full bore with a shellfish nitrogen mitigation program? That's a damn good question. So I money. You know, so I work I work for the Nature Conservancy and you know, looking at coastal and estuarine health is is like the driving force behind the work that we do near shore, coastal, and upland. And so I have colleagues that are working on the very question on the Cape in the town of Barnstable, looking at the different alternatives to sewering because you can't sewer all of Cape Cod and, and the, the whole story that goes along with that. but. Um, I, I often am fearful of people thinking that I or others think that shellfish is the answer and, and I don't think that is true and I don't think, I think it's foolish to think that way. Um, what I do think is that uh, addressing nitrogen pollution at its source is the only way to have a meaningful impact to our estuarine health. And, you know, so when the towns start getting into growing, you know, millions and millions of, of shellfish that then go on the market, that um, the impact to the businesses that have been reliant on shellfish for years and years, I, I have to, I draw a line between the interest that I have in the health of the coastal ecosystem and the problem of where it's coming from. And so we think that shellfish restoration can do things like clean up water quality or improve water quality, but we're also doing it for habitat for other species. Instead of having thick black anoxic muck on the bottom to have structured habitat for other fish and other species, to think about using shellfish in areas that may see high erosion rates, uh, areas that People are considering putting a bulkhead in and that instead using natural solutions on the shoreline like building marshes that might have shellfish incorporated into those types of projects that I think that there's value there. I couldn't agree with you more that um, trying to clean up nitrogen after the fact is the wrong way to approach the problem. I just want to address that as well. and I. I <laughs> I, 
you know, I, I think Steve's right on. And, and there is a really, this is a really tough issue on the Cape. And, you know, I don't want to make it a, you know, a punchline. There are a lot of communities spending a lot of money to put in sanitary infrastructure and, you know, do on land solutions. And there are, you know, some communities that are using shellfish at a certain percentage to also address the issue. And there are some cases where that may be the best solution. But, you know, clearly we're seeing secondary impacts associated with that. And this is part of the challenge of being a commonwealth in a town rural state is that we're, un we're uniquely sensitive to a lack of coordination in some areas. And so, you know, there's a lot of discussion going on around that, which is one of the reasons why, you know, th it needs to be presented from the commercial, recreational, and aquaculture perspective. Because there are secondary impacts that are coming from this. They're, this is not a silver bullet. I don't, know, I don't think most communities are looking at it like that. I certainly know DEP isn't looking at it like that. But some of this, you know, it, it takes educating these people that are making these decisions on, you know, maybe this isn't the best fit. And the division is taking a strong role in making sure that, you know, we don't have propagation programs that are creating more shellfish than they, than they have habitat for in their community. Um, you know, and that it's a good mix, but it is a challenge. And I don't want to turn it into a punchline, but we, 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 it is something that your voice in this room needs to be a part of, and it hasn't been. Okay. It wasn't my show, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. They didn't ask me either if it makes you feel better. Uh, I just have a quick question about the, um, you said that you take recommendations and it gets tossed around a little bit and they get turned into regulations. No. Could you describe that process, like exactly how that works and who's doing the regulating? So D I, D I, I, that wasn't stated today. We did, talked about recommendations and that, you know, as DMF looks at policy, we're going to look at everything that we've seen from public input to documents like this, to the aquaculture strategic plan, um, to our, our Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission input. Um, but if there are recommendations that come out of the MSI that deal with regulation at the DMF level, you know, it's going to go through the same regulatory promulgation process, which means that DMF will draft whatever that's going to look like. It's going to go through 17 lawyers at the state, and then it's going to go to the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission for them to approve us to go to public comment. We then go to public comment where it's a minimum 21 days, but normally it's longer than that. And any community that's ever asked us to extend a public comment window for these, we have. Um, and, uh, and then it goes back to the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission, goes back to the lawyers, and then it becomes a regulation or not. We've seen Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission decide not to approve our regulations or recommendation for regulations. Um, you know, likewise with any statutory recommendations that come out of this, they're going to get robust public hearing and go through the same process. This will not change that process. Okay, so the bottom line is DMF is still <clears throat> doing the regulating and the MSI is not a regulatory body, is that That's right? That's 100% correct. Yes, sir. Okay. And I think as an agency, we've gotten pretty good at weeding through the BS. And so, you know, we recognize that people here have their own interests. And, you know, we're not just going to jump into it wholeheartedly in, in, blindly. We, you know, we're going to make decisions based on sound policy, sound, bio, sound management, sound biology. And I think, likewise, if you look at the, the representation from the House and Senate on here, you have a really, really incredible informed House member um, that's, right, that, that's right around the corner here that knows this, this stuff and isn't going to accept policy that isn't best for their constituents. I, I believe that. Okay, I, I'd certainly like to hear what a lot of the audience questions might be. I just got one more is, uh, have you learned anything from like shellfish initiatives in neighboring states, Rhode Island, even Washington State, or what, you know, what pieces have you picked up that have been helpful, and what things do you think you could do better? I think the, uh, one of the most important take-homes that I've heard from several of the states is to meet early and often with constituents, right? Um, and that's part of why we're, we're, we've offered to do these informational sessions. We're at the very beginning of, 
of a 12 to, to 20 month process of collecting information and drafting up these, these recommendations and then taking them back out to the communities to figure out if they're the right thing or not and to find consensus. Um, what I've noticed is that for a lot of them, what comes out of these initiatives in other states are very high arching things like you need to sewer your communities to clean up your water or you need public education and outreach initiatives to make sure the rest of the of the general public values and understands what's going on on the flats um, or we need to set up a, a new uh, lab and research space to grow native shellfish populations and restore commercial beds, right? Like they're, they're fairly, fairly large um, overarching concepts. It's not, it really hasn't been getting down into the nitty gritty of, of regulations and policy. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to, to speak to that. Yeah, the, I think the only thing I'll add is that I, I think in, in uh, like in Washington State, they were able to um, get a bunch of money after this, after their early stages of uh, getting their shellfish initiative kicked off, and so they were able to like, you know, source funding for more hatchery capacity for their state. That's I think like one, one example. I use Washington State on the other side. You know, maybe they went too far in saying we want to grow aquaculture, we want to grow this, and. You know, DMF is coming into this and making sure that we're efficient and sustainable, not with any, you know, predetermined, we want to grow aquaculture, we want to grow propagation, we want to grow enhancement. We want to make sure that we're using the resources responsibly and that, you know, efficiently. And I think Washington may have gone too far in that we want to grow, grow, grow scenario. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something that I think this group and the task force has taken to heart um, and it's important. Yep. In fact, and I'll add to that, in fact, you, you'll, you'll hear from many, as I have in the aquaculture industry, they don't want to see expansion. There's already too much product out there and that's what's impacting the softening of prices in some cases. But it gives them a central place to talk to the other folks who are also involved in the harvest industry, wild, recreational, or the town programs. The proposal that was mentioned several times already in New Bedford, they're looking at 8,400 acres that they wanted to consider for aquaculture without knowing exactly where it would be planted, how much would be planted, where it would go. That should put the fear into everybody involved in any kind of shellfish market, wild uh, harvest or farm raised with that kind of volume. That would quadruple the amount, actually, yeah, it would quadruple the amount of acreage that's currently leased if that were all leased in Massachusetts. And the impacts would just be, it would be immeasurable. Now I know New Bedford's come back and they've said they're not intending to lease out 8,400 acres. <laughs> but the initial spot was much like the comments that have come around the MSI. It was perceived to be something that it wasn't. So the 8,400 acres was for them to consider looking at, like many Cape Towns have, aquaculture development areas to ultimately go out, pre-permit different areas that might be suitable for either nursery cultivation or for, for a, a grow out itself. But that's still a long way off. They don't even have their, their pro program in place yet. Thanks. All right, is it time to open it up to yeah, public I questions? Question. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, there's one more question. Jim, I just wanted I'll to get ask you the gentleman from the Conservancy. Yeah. Do any of your funds go to the point source of the sewage issues? Or, or are you basically looking at the ecosystems as you we're describing earlier, which is part of, which makes a lot of sense to me, but if you have a lot of money and the re restoration projects are for creating habitat for everything else that lives in the water, and we're the ones along, I'm sure there's other things involved in the issue with the water and nitrates, nitrogen, I should say. Do you spend any money, any of the money that you receive on projects for smaller towns that really can't mitigate the issue with shellfish? Yeah, so actual structure, I mean, treatment? Yeah, I, so I don't know much of, I don't know why I always have this. Um, like, I, I'm not a trained scientist on the nitrogen cycle and that sort of thing. I, I come to this, you know, I used to have my own lease. I used to have a, a farm 
uh, here in Massachusetts. But so that's sort of where my focus is. I have colleagues that are working on this issue. And so, yeah, money is being directed through, uh, through staff in my office that are working on trying to understand septic uh, processes. Because like the, a regular Title V septic uh, doesn't deal with nitrogen at all. And so uh, it was not designed to. And right. so that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. So we, so there are people in my office that are working on trying to identify alternatives to at the source in septic systems, alternative septic systems that uh, that are effective at removing nitrogen, and then trying to figure out how to scale that up. So that you know, working with people over at the test center, which is up by the canal, where the, George Hoyfelder is like the man, and understanding how this whole process works and. Um, so I, so I don't spend time on that, but people in my office do. Because there hasn't been a huge, I'm not familiar with a huge technology change in Title V for 30 years. No. I know there are some. I know there are some that aren't approved for use in Massachusetts. Yeah, no, I'm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, so I think I think it's a really important question. I mean, it's it's it starts to get a little afield from dealing well, with right shellfish right management and that kind of thing. But I, I'll gladly talk to you more about it because I I think there's a lot to be done there. Well, Just right, it always comes down to money. People, you know, hesitate to spend a ton of money on anything. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. However, if you know, from a selfish point of view. If you use oysters and other shellfish to to put a Band-Aid on a problem that's over there, I'm not saying it can't be a part of it, but to go down that road as you and Chris. I think you'll see, Jim, that most communities that are working on a 208 plan or that you know have addressed this issue, Shellfish is actually a smaller part of, of their plan, and some of that is these alternative sewer or alternative septic systems, and as well as these uh, reactive barriers that, that pick it up before it leaches from the groundwater in. Um, but like you said, they're expensive, and so they're looking at developing 20-year plans that they have to be able to fund. And um, but I, I have seen a number of communities where that that kind of advanced septic system is part of that, either that or, or these reactive permeal bar barriers where they're capturing nitrogen at that source. Yeah, at least but we're 100 years too late <laughs> in some places. Well, it was 1972 when <clears throat> yeah. we kind of started, and that's a hell of a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, I, I, at least if, if I can see where, you know, in ACEC areas where, you know, that, that's probably most likely where a lot of the issues are coming from. So well, it's not, I mean, it's definitely a start. If people are really concerned about water quality, you know, you go to the source. And I, you know, because I don't, it's not going to go away if you. No, I agree. Agreed. Yeah. With animals that have to leave in order for them to effectively do the job. I can tell you that Wellfleet does have good regulations about downtown for instance that there are septic systems that you, it's required that you get a, a fast system which is you know a normal system would be about twelve thousand dollars that's about thirty thousand dollars right so would, would this be the type of thing that we would want us to put in our three challenges for the town that MSI would look at because I know we're not really here to talk about septic systems tonight we need to move on and, and really concentrate and try to make sure we're talking about MSI but when you talk about challenges, is that the type of challenge that MSI would be willing to talk about statewide? Yeah, so if one of the things is like we have a certain area in our town that's closed to harvest that we would like to have reopen, what's the best, what's the best way that we can get that area reopened? And maybe that starts when you start talking down this road of why is it closed and how do you change that? That's, I think that's one. Thing right. that can get raised here. And when you talk about broad reaching, though, we would want something that would help the state of Massachusetts, that we could look at ideas that could be implemented in all towns, not just Wellfleet necessarily, to really clean this up. 
because um, we do want to stay kind of on topic. It's already getting to be 820, and I know there's a lot of people out in the audience that probably have questions. I saw Chopper's hand go up before Helen took the podium. So is Ch Chopper young? Yeah, let me let me definitely fully categorize that that 8,400 acres was the amount of approved or conditionally approved area within New Bedford. That full stop. That's where that number came from. If you look at the acreage between Clark's Cove and outside of New Bedford, it's 8,400 acres. Um, yep. Yeah. That New Bedford is fully aware that all of that is subject to a biological survey, and that you know it's the same process. In fact, when you make a statement like we're going to have 8,400 acres of aquaculture, we have to review it as if all 8,400 acres are aquaculture. So they don't get to say we're just going to do four acres. We have to look at it. So they need to, to they, they have been in discussions with coming to terms with what, you know, what that may mean and what they mean. But I really think the 8,400 was, it was a mischaracterization. Within these 8,400, they're, they're looking at aquaculture. Oh, it's to, to, to a state regulator as well, Chopper. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. And, and the number actually came because they put out, New Bedford put out, a request for interest that framed 8,400 acres. That was their request that came out. You know, but as Chris said, it's, it was for them not knowing enough, if anything at all, about what it really took, putting out a blanket statement to see what kind of interest they got when they actually lit a, lit a fuse more than they actually put out any kind of interest. Okay, Helen, if you will introduce yourself. Yes, of course. Um, Helen Miranda Wilson, former member of the Shellfish Committee and going into my seventh year on the Shellfish Regulatory Board. Um, I e. have Board of Selectmen. A lot of yeah, people don't know that that's know. the Board of Selectmen. I know, it's slash Board of Select Board. So I have uh, a question from Damian Parkington, a member of the Shellfishing Community that he emailed to the Select Board. And I have one of my own questions, but I'd like to read Damien's question first. And mine sort of tags on to it. This is getting back to the genesis. In the beginning was not the task force. In the beginning was the appointing authority or whatever small group of people or person got together and thought up who to put on the task force. Who was that? Please. That was the myself at the Fisherman's Alliance, Steve at the Nature Conservancy, Chris Sherman at, from Mass Aquaculture Association in conjunction with DMF, represented by Chris, and uh, the Secretary Beaton's office. Thank you. Now I'm going to read Damien's um, question. Why was Wellfleet left off the MSI task force? Now, we're special. All the different communities are special. We know that. But... Consider the statistics, which I don't have to run by you, about the amount of shellfish we put out and how long we've been doing it. And how much we know, because a lot of what's in all your mission statements and your goals, we have been doing for years, and we are doing actively now with our functional shellfish department and our functional shellfish advisory board. And Damien's, one of Damien's questions was, why did you not come to us, at least an outreach conference? Why did you not use us as a model? That's the first part of one of his questions. And why was there no substantial outreach to our Shellfish Advisory Board, which again is extremely functional and dealing with a massive amount of harvesting and growing and wild habitat, right? We really know a lot. And in some cases, historically, we've known it longer than the DMF in a funny way, you know? So that was Damien's question. And why is it that um, there was no outreach um, regarding the formation of the formal body to manage and form opinions, right? Um, the MSI, you know, does and form opinions that the MSI implies that it will address in its mission statement. Why did you not come to us? And then I've got a horrible question of my own. 
<laughs> you answered part of one of Damien's questions, okay? But what was the thought process given that a bunch of you were sitting at the table, right? Why did you not think of Wellfleet? Why did you think of, for example, Duxbury before Wellfleet, okay? Why? Did you think we were all so bad that we couldn't give you helpful advice? I'm, I'm being funny, but I'm not. No, I, I mean, I, uh, I, I'm not sure I have a good answer for you. I think it was uh, genuinely an oversight with no malintent, which is part of the reason we're here now and why that this group is going to recommend to the task force that um, that membership or interests from wealthy join that task force. Okay, can I ask my horrible question? Is it true that the state or the feds, federal agencies, receive money, donations from private sectors like Walmart, for example? I'm not quite sure what their corporation's formal name is. I'll just call them Walmart. And if so, how do they benefit from that, aside from having a tax deduction, a tax write-off? So, asking, so the, the, the state and the division in particular, many agencies apply for grants to do work. You know, we put out the proposal. This is what we're going to do. And it's in response to a call for proposals. And so, you know, assuming the, the entity who's offering the funds is specifically looking for research on a particular or a, 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 a project that suits whatever the RFP is, whatever the call for proposals are. And so, you know, the Division of Marine Fisheries has worked with the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, with NOAA, with National Fish and Wildlife Federation, with a whole bunch of different organizations to, to get our statutory mission done. You know, we, we, we come up, we have more funding through grants that in our operating budget, in our budget than we do get, than we get from the legislature. Mr. Scalacci. Yes, ma'am. What I asked about was money from the private sector. Wait, so. Do those agencies get money from the private sector? And I said, yes, we get, it, we get funds from a wide range of, of groups, including the National Fish and Wildlife Federation, which funded this grant. That's not a federal entity. It's a nonprofit. Okay. And we get funds, I think we've applied for funds I don't know the exact portfolio of, of grants that we've, we've applied for, but whatever the objective is, is clearly stated in our proposal, and that's what the objective is. Most of the time, it's to either further our statutory mandate, collect fisheries research, to look at regulations and their impacts. There's a broad number of things. You know, we do recreational fisheries surveys. We do a number of things, much of which is grant funded. Do they get a seat at the table? What influence, besides a tax write-off, which I understand helps big, rich corporations and private agencies, not agencies, but private groups, what do they get? What kind of influence do they get to tell you what questions to ask? No, absolutely not. And I okay. absolutely despise the question. Thank you. Yeah. I, it, these <laughs> things are in the air. And it's worth asking and having you answer in a straightforward way. And, and that's fair, Helen, but, you know, as an agency, we have a statutory mandate, we have strategic goals, and we often seek grant funds to meet those strategic goals where our legislatively given funding doesn't, doesn't get us there. And no, we don't give people seats at the table or influence for money. We are a ethical and you know we stand by our ethics at this agency and so that's why I take offense to the question just a bit. Thank you. So the next time I call you with a stupid question of my own you'll hang up on me. <laughs> I, can, I can be offended and still answer your calls though. <laughs> uh, okay um, we, we have a couple people here. Kurt you you um, you were coming up first. Berta and, well I'm gonna go right down the line. Sure. I <clears throat> I guess my voice is pretty bad tonight. Sorry about that. Um, I have a couple of comments because I've been involved. Uh, obviously, I'm the one of Kurt Felix. Uh, I am on the wastewater committee in the town of Wellfleet. I have been for about seven or eight years. I also serve as the town's representative to the Cape Cod Water Protection Collaborative, which was involved in developing the 208 plan. Um, so I've been intimately, intimately involved in, in this for quite some time and, and I think um, was also involved in trying to um, 
support and demonstrate that uh, oysters and shellfish and aquaculture uh, could in fact be a part of the, the 208 plan. Uh, and one of the things that I think has happened, I just want to make a quick comment about that. One of the things that I think has happened that's, that's really irritating to probably everybody in this audience is the idea that you have to take an oyster out of the water to get a nitrogen credit. In other words, you're creating a situation where a town's nitrogen mitigation plan or strategy is now competing with the oyster industry, which is crazy. I mean, I think that's about the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Um, and secondly, uh, the oyster that stays in the water as part of a restoration program produces substantially uh, larger nitrogen benefits than the oyster that's, that's harvested. That's not to say that aquaculture doesn't make a huge contribution, and, and obviously it does. But what I'm trying to say is that this should all be win-win, and the idea that nit nitrogen and nutrient mitigation strategies should somehow um, harm the industry is, is just nuts. And it doesn't have to happen. Um, I do want to say a couple other things about um, Wellfleet in particular. One of the challenges that we face as a community with regard to uh, wastewater management, and that is that only about 10%, 5 to 10% of, of our nitrogen is coming from people. Uh, about 90% is natural in the environment. And one of the solutions is to restore ecosystem health, which includes things like uh, oysters and, and reef. It includes things like salt marsh and salt marsh enhancement and, and, and uh, restoration. It also includes things like dredging. Uh, the black mayo that's in the harbor is a large source of recycling nutrient now. The other thing about that is that, is that when we restore ecosystem function, the other thing that happens is we tend to reduce the amount of black mayo because a lot of the black mayo is coming from decaying and dying vegetation. So when that stuff dies, if there aren't filter feeders, whether it's oysters, whether it's clams, razor clams, uh, whether it's you know the filter feeding fish, um, restoration of Manhattan and other things, if we don't restore some level, serious level of ecosystem function, we're going to continue to fight black mayo. And black mayo is, is, is a very negative impact on the industry right now. I mean, the folks who are in the business understand what it's doing to their uh, to the actual growth rates and also to the quality of the product. So I just wanted to make a couple of those comments. The other thing is, is that we have probably about 100 to $150 million um, that would be at stake if we're going to go down the path of building sewers. And the DEP is going to require that we have a plan to do just that in the town of Wellfleet. And where we have so little of the nitrogen that ultimately uh, comes from people, the things that we can do in ecosystem restoration, whether it's any of those different buckets, including dredging, including removing the old uh, railroad bridge, the things that make sense in the town of Wellfleet that are the lowest cost should be done first and from a taxpayer standpoint. And as obviously, as long as they don't uh, negatively impact other people in the town. So I, I just wanted to say that the, the, the plan that the town of Wellfleet is working on, that the wastewater committee has been working on, is going to be very, very sensitive to the shellfish community. There's at least two representatives of the shellfish community on the wastewater committee. So uh, the aquaculture and shellfish interests are very heavily represented on that committee as well. So I this I just wanted to clarify that this 208, this nitrogen mitigation, nutrient mitigation, restoration, whatever you want to call it, the ideas around that that are currently being bandied about in other communities, as I said, don't make sense. And, and this, this effort, that effort, does not have to be in conflict with the industry. Thank you. Berta? I'm Berta Bruning, and um, my, hus my late husband acquired our grant in 1977, so we've been around a while. My problem is that with that very last bullet point up there. I think that is one of the worst ideas that I have seen in a long time. The town of Wellfleet has been managing our shellfish grants for far longer than 1977, and I think as a town we've done a darn good job of it. Trans con continuity of transferability of shellfish leases, meaning as I understand it, that somehow shellfish grants would be owned by the individual, pay taxes on it, 
And then when that particular shellfish person wanted to go out of business, would sell it to the highest bidder. Well, what I think that does, it eliminates the small grower. Because let's say that I want to get out of my business and sell my grant, and John Jones says, I'll give you $30,000 for your grant, Berta. How does that sound? And I say, that sounds pretty good. But then ABC Incorporated says, oh, I'll give you $50,000. Well, that sounds better. And I think that that puts our shellfish grants into the hands of what will turn out to be not too very many entities. And right now, shellfishing is a way that young people can earn a living in Wellfleet. And that, I'm not saying that anybody is making millions, but they can earn a living in Wellfleet. And when that's taken away from our town, that's when we are in trouble, when our young people cannot earn a living in this town. And I think that bullet needs to be done away with. And I hope that every other, thank yeah. you. Thank you. That's it. Don't need to talk any further. God bless you, Berta. Yeah. No, I mean, I think what's important is, is that if, if that wasn't there, then the only time you'd have a chance to talk about it would be at the State House in Boston on a Tuesday at 2 p.m. or something like that. That's not a, a representative of support by the MSI task force. I can tell you right off the bat, DMF doesn't want to see anything happen to undermine town rule for aquaculture and shellfish management. We're 100 percent supportive of that. But it needs to have, it should be there so that people talk about it and that your legislators hear your concern about it. Because if not, it just goes right through the state. And, and you know, you have incredible representatives out here that would not let that happen. They've already said that, you know, they have significant issues with that bill. But I think it, it's a great example of why this is important. Because if not, this just happens in Boston at the State House. It doesn't happen here. So thank you for what you said. and. Uh, Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, Kathleen Bacon, Wellfleet Select Board. Um, this is the second time I've seen this presentation, Melissa. And I think um, <clears throat> the goals are very lofty. And ultimately, if it's, you know, good for us, then, you know, we'll step up. But I question the survey. 389 uh, just doesn't sit well with me, and I think that was brought up at the East Ham presentation. So I'd like to see the survey results broadened and expanded um, with more shellfishmen involved in that survey. But thank you for tonight. Thank you, and I, I appreciate that comment, and we've heard that across a lot of the communities, and that survey was never intended to inform the MSI recommendations. It was a starting point to see if we needed an MSI and the assessment committee has been charged with with going out and collecting more information and so those additional surveying and, and input will happen I was just gonna tack on to Kathleen's question too um, so it said that and you know a lot of we, we've talked about the survey before you know and you guys talked about the assessment committee and uh, you know it was a lot of times deemed sort of biased, you know, like into um, making the MSI relevant. And, you know, so, you know, it only rep it captured 10% of wild commercial harvester input and having just under 400 survey res respondents representing the entire state. Since this is the case, where does this leave us now? And how is the MSI relevant or needed if the basis of warranting the MSI was the survey? I think the, the basis of MSI and warranting it were, were all of the challenges and issues that we've, we've talked about and have identified that are coming down the pike, these emerging issues. And the survey was another piece of that, right? Okay. And I, I, I recognize and I agree that we didn't, we didn't capture enough feedback in that survey but I feel like I'm doing a disservice to the communities if I just stop talking about it, right? I haven't removed it from the presentation because it is a part of how we got here today. Um, that being said, we, we absolutely will, will do a better job going forward with this. Thanks. Okay, step right up, Phil. Yes. 
assessment committee. Sure. We'll do a better job. I'm Suzanne Phillips. I go by Phil, and I am on the assessment committee as a person from Orleans. And I just want to say that at the, my impression at the last, or the one and only assessment committee meeting, was that the feedback was very strong that we needed to start with the communities. And in fact, that is what the group decided to do. And under the um, chairmanship of Jeff Kennedy from DMF, there is a draft that was just sent to assessment committee members, and they're asking for our feedback by this Friday, and then it will be sent out, and they're starting with all the constables and all the shellfish committees knowing that not all towns even have a shellfish committee. And then after that, we are expected to lead the charge towards getting input in our communities. So I think it was heard at that meeting that the initial survey was certainly not um, representative of everybody who needs to be heard in this. And the process has been changed and it is happening. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, Sorry. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, and I've been fishing probably less time than every other fisherman in here. But I don't even understand this. Like, I find it impossible. It's like a horoscope. It's impossibly vague, so general. And I, I don't mean to be adversarial, but I've been tr going to the meetings and trying to understand it and trying to wrap my mind around the need for it. And I can't, I just can't figure out why we're even going to these places. And every single thing up there I have a question about. Like guidelines, what would guidelines look like? What do, why do we need leasing? Why do we, so I don't mean to just blow the whole thing up and I'll be quick and then I'll sit down and you can chalk it off to my stupidity. Sorry, Diane Brunt. Um, but I'm overwhelmed by how much I don't understand, and I'm not sure what's broken that this is trying to fix. Um, so the only other thing I wanted to say was I'm not convinced that what this seems to be is a centralizing process for handling stuff, and I'm not convinced that what shell fishing in Massachusetts needs is centralizing problem solving, because it seems to me it needs not that. Like, that I feel like our shellfish department listens to what we need, we listen to what they say, and then we solve the problems that we have, and they're not the same as other places. So I guess I'm just frustrated by that, and I would just, the only analogy I can give is when I was, used to be teaching, I thought I would go to Oakland, I'd find out what the problems were, then I'd go to law school, then I'd go to DC, and then I'd solve the problems. And what I realized when I was in Oakland is I couldn't solve the problems in the class next to me, because they were so specific to what was going on. And other than money, there wasn't any policy that they could make in DC that was gonna solve what was happening in Oakland, because only the people that were there knew what was really going on. So DC would make a policy like smaller student-teacher ratio, and that would totally fuck up, mess Oakland up because <laughs> now you could only have 15 kids for teacher, but they weren't building schools. So now they had curtains separating, so the teachers are, so it just, the further away you got from the issue, the worse the problem solving got. And that's just been my experience without really understanding what's going on, so I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Uh, oh, to oh, well, Francis, I just have a question about the, if this is just getting going, and MSI is just getting going, where's the funding coming from for MSI? And as you get bigger, where's the money going to come from? As you get bigger, where's that money going to come from to govern you guys? So MSI isn't an entity or a body. Um, it is a process of creating these forums and having these discussions, and it's funded for the next year and a half by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Um, and once the strategic plan is done, MSI goes away, right? Like, we're not creating a new process that, that is gonna absorb what you guys are doing in town. We're, I recognize that, that things aren't broken, but there are some emerging, emerging issues that 
we think that bringing people together to talk about how we deal with that could be helpful. And at the end of the day, if, if what comes out of MSI isn't helpful to your community, you can ignore it, right? It's, we. Can I ask one? Absolutely. Absolutely, uh, David, you could uh, hop on uh, next, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, truly, these are the things that come to my mind when I think about why DMF is participating in this. I mean, how many of you remember when QPX wiped out half the cohogs in this state? Mm -hmm. Are we any better prepared today than we were then to deal with this? No. In fact, we got rid of the only funding that we had to monitor for shellfish diseases last year. And quite frankly, the three groups that came together to, to really lobby to get money into the bond bill for CMAC to do it were these three groups right here. You know, and it, there's still another up, uphill battle to get that money authorized and to actually get it in the hands of CMAC so that they can do disease testing. Who remembers the first Vibrio control plan and how disruptive that was? You know, the only funding to help growers and other folks deal with that, DAR can't spend anymore on shellfish. They have to focus on FISMA and their, their integration of farms into the federal system. You know, we're not in any better place to deal with that. And we're one quahog case away from having a hard shell clam vibrio control plan. That would be as disruptive as oysters was, that would be that much worse. I can keep going. You know, while SPAT did a great job of getting buckets and, and, and everything following the norovirus outbreak, let's not pretend there aren't thousands of recre recreational boaters and beachgoers that aren't one vomit away from, from another six week closure. We don't have in-house capacity to test for ASP. That shut half the state down for eight, eight weeks. I and mean, we're not any better prepared to deal with these issues than we were 15 years ago, 20 years ago, five years ago. And there are more coming. We're getting pressure from FDA to close, to treat mooring fields like marinas. That would close half of Wellfleet Harbor. We're fighting tooth and nail against that, and we're winning. But that means all of that energy that we were doing, you know, to support other services is going towards that. When I say there's these emerging issues that are coming down the road that will have disruptive impacts, I'm not trying to hype this up. I, I don't care how we get to the process of making sure that DMF and other state agencies and municipalities can, can provide the resources that are federally mandated to even keep these areas open. We will be closing areas if something doesn't change. FDA is changing the way that we have to do it's, you know, storm-related reopenings. They want us to test shellfish from all across the state to reopen areas. That would take weeks to get it done. And it's a totally unfunded mandate and totally outside of the scope of the way that we use our resources. This is stuff that, you know, like I said, I don't care how we get it done, but we do need to address these. And this, I do think, is a meaningful form, and DMF thinks is a meaningful way to at least put these issues on the table. When, when they say recommendations, what I truly see is maybe we'll agree on we should worry about diseases, we should worry about Vibrio, but it's going to be these are ways that this community thinks is the best to address this or this sector thinks to address it. The things that we're going to come to a single consolidated recommendation on are probably the low-hanging fruit and things that everybody around the dinner table would agree is a good idea with no information on shell fishing. The things that we haven't been able to solve for the last 20 years I don't think they're getting solved through MSI, but we're at least going to have a conversation and we'll put the opinions and views on the table. So when someone proposes legislation that they know is going to be totally rejected by Wellfleet, fair warnings there on the piece of paper. <laughs> you know, it's, it is a meaningful process. DMF sees it as a meaningful process. And we are concerned about things that are coming down the pike. And those are just the ones we can see. Dave? I, I, was, I was just going to... This, what was just talked about kind of answers like or is part of like three questions you know like when Aaron was asking um, where does this funding come from you know and it and it comes from the National Fish and Wildlife Fund found funded by is, that's funded by the Walton family right is that is that wrong or so it's partially right NIFWIF or National Fish and Wildlife Foundation is a quasi government nonprofit. So some of their funding comes from NOAA, the Federal Gov National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association in the Department of Commerce, and some of their funding comes from private foundations, Walton being one of them, the 
um, Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, the McKnight Foundation. Um, there's a whole laundry list of, of private foundations that are supporting that work. So that that's kind of sort of like, I do care how we get to these sources, you know, like, like that I don't, I don't want like the Walton family, you know, and which leads me to my net, like, like supporting this, you know what I mean? But which leads me to my next question for like my, our legislators who aren't here, you know, and like why, how come the state doesn't have funding to get stakeholder input on their own? And how can the state get more funding to do this without private entity involvement? You know, because it's, it, this is like indicative of like how our state government is working, that they have to rely on you guys to get what Chris needs done, you know? So if anything can come of this, the state needs more funding mm -hmm. so that we don't have to rely on you guys and he can do his job correctly. I'm hopeful that that's one of the recommendations that comes out of this in the end, or that's one of the things that I'm gonna be working for is to better fund DMF. Okay, audience, Richard, did you have your hand up there earlier? Yeah, but I've forgotten, Barbara, what I'm gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Richard Blakely <laughs> from South Wealth Lake. <laughs> um, if New Bedford and Gloucester and Duxbury love MSI, why don't you start there? So, so those communities have a seat on the task force, um, and so they, they have been involved since day one, and I can't speak as to whether they think it's a good idea yet or not, because we haven't had an informational meeting like this in those communities yet. So does MSI exist yet, or does it, or is, does it not? It has started, yes. Okay, because you said, course. you said people have come to MSI and they've asked us, and and I'm so like, those are things that either came out of the, the initial three groups or feedback that I've heard over the last month and a half of doing these presentations from various communities. Some of them were also brought up at the first task force meeting. Like yes. the division talked about the, the map, the strategic, uh, or the, the special review procedure and things like that. And of course, I'm personally, you know, the last point is, uh, uh, I'm concerned about the Wellfleet's historical standing in the shellfish business. And uh, I stepped into a man's boots, and a man is going to step into my boots. And uh, I, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm terrified that, that there is, uh, you know, there's, there's actually talk about um, privatizing aquaculture leases. And, uh, you know, um, when it happens, if it happens, you know, uh, our identity is gone and you're never going to get it back. You know, I see Aaron, Aaron Francis just spoke and, and, uh, He is third generation. I, I, I used to watch his dad out on the bed, and now I watch him. It, you know, it, I'm, you know that the historical significance of Wellfleet and the shellfish business, I am deeply concerned with. Um, and I don't want to see that lost. And... Uh, um, I'm a, I've actually looked into looking into the feasibility of getting Wellfleet Harbor declared a historic area. So that would mean no more grants. That would mean no nothing. We would, we would stay the way we are right now or 18 months from now. And um, I'd be fine with that because I just don't know I'm unsure. Uh, I read the MSI website, and I, and I, I mean, it's 
you got to be very smart to write down something and have it not say anything. <laughs> or, or work for the state, maybe. <laughs> now, Chris, I didn't say that. <laughs> Putting words in my <laughs> and, and now, uh, Scott, you said you, this hinge line does not exist yet, and you don't, you're not a... Formally constituted yet. No. You're not associated with it? With hinge line? Yeah. Yes, I am. Ah. It's not formally constituted. We haven't registered any kind of papers to be incorporated. Because I listened to you the other night on a podcast, you and Bill Mook. Right. And you that, said that you were hinge, associated was, with hinge line. That's right. But that was not a hinge line podcast. That was something entirely different. But I would encourage anyone to listen to it. Share the link. I will. I hope you do. <laughs> you do. Richard, can I ask you a question? Do you, do you think that MAA would, would have put this bill out if it, without MSI? Yeah. Yes. I absolutely agree with you. Because uh, is, I'm, worried about the, I'm worried about the president of the Mass Aquaculture Association and I'm worried about his, his, uh, his uh, Duxbury affiliation. Well, it's Seth and now. you know. Actually, the former president now, the current president is Seth. Well, he's, he's already done his damage because I'm, I, I, I don't want any of this shit in Wellfleet. I'm totally against it. Yeah. You know, and you're, if you come for our, you know, our property, our bottom, you better be armed with something more than a fistful of papers. That's what I got to say. I can't see who's handed. Oh, Bob, Mr. Wallace. Come back to follow, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, Scott, I've come a long way since we had like two bushels in the town of Wellfleet in 1984. And I think there's a lot of paranoia between this room, your board, um, and paranoia comes from misunderstanding. Um, it was touched on the um, uh, restoration projects that Wellfleet's been going through, and that is a reaction to the Conservation Law Foundation's lawsuit that required every coastal town in Cape Cod to mitigate their nitrogen loading. So trying to avoid $60 million in sewerage we threw some moisture out there and other towns got that same kind of economics and now there's a fear that if every town has these restoration projects there's so many oysters out there and then marine fisheries requires that a certain amount has to be harvested because it can't go on forever DEP DEP okay <laughs> the state <laughs> um, we don't want to go the way of the cranberries and uh, we all know where they went destroying 25% of their last year's harvest to keep the price up we've already seen prices decline everyone thinks geez I did half a million why not do a million I never did that but um, so it's on us that we're overproducing. It, it produces the logical economics in the marketplace. So I'm trying to summarize and give you a synopsis of where some of this paranoia might be coming from. Uh, and we don't need any more oysters. So how do you mitigate your nitrogen loading, avoiding shellfish restoration projects and it's all over the east coast at the same time you're going to keep the price up on oysters and that's what the fear is in everyone in this room that grows oysters so you got your work cut out for you as far as um, the initiative to change the wording in uh, section 52 from may to shall i think that emulated not from Wellfleet, it, it came from um, Plymouth, Duxbury area. And I think, as an aside, if they have a problem down there, they should fix it on a town, local level. Don't bring the whole state into the whole transferability <coughs> of grants just because you got a problem. So fix it. 
keep it local. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the overview of what my perspective is and why there's paranoia here. I'm sure you, it's palpable on your end to be in this room with a bunch of oyster growers that are struggling to keep the market enough to, high enough to sustainable. Sustainability should be paramount in your whole purview of um, what, you, what you're trying to accomplish. So, um, and I just heard tonight before this meeting that in order for the oyster to be a nitrogen reducer, it has to be harvested. So I don't know where that stands. I was corrected by um, uh, a previous speaker that Kurt. that's Kurt. <coughs> um, that that's ludicrous. Uh, the bigger the oyster, the more nitrogen it's going to take out of the system. And but Wellfleet has a real economic problem that if the oysters don't take the nitrogen out, then you got another five years to figure out to avoid a center centralized system. And that's like no less than $60 million. So this is coming down on us. Oysters is just one piece of the puzzle. And I think that's where a lot of the paranoia exists. So grow less oysters, keep the price up. Thank you. Chris, could, Chris um, could, you, could you make it clear who says the oysters have to be taken out of the system? Did you say that's DEP? No, and essentially what's happened in a number of communities around Massachusetts and around, around you know, the states is looking at pilot projects like Orleans Lonnie's Pond and other places and trying to identify a measurable way to understand how much nitrogen is being taken out of the water body by shellfish. And one very clear way to do that is actually looking at the content of nitrogen inside of the tissue and the shell of the oyster. So you remove it and you can quantify the amount of nitrogen that's been removed, which is a lot easier to understand than the denitrification process, which is hopefully where something like this would go, where it's very likely that shellfish and and filter feeders are stimulating increased denitrification, and we're actually seeing more nitrogen coming out of the, the sediments through denitrification than we are when you actually remove the oyster from the water. Um, but the most measurable and straightforward way to, to you know, understand the amount of nitrogen that an oyster takes out of the water is to take it out of the water and remove all that meat that contains the nitrogen. They use nitrogen to grow, and that's where you know, the nitrogen that's being taken out of the water is. It, that's how it's being identified. Um, yeah, I think if DEP the, had their way, shellfish wouldn't be a part of this because it's not easy to measure. But we're looking at a really dynamic, challenging problem, and there are some places where sewering isn't going to be an option. There are some places where these alternative mitigation strategies aren't going to be an option, and shellfish may be a good option. But it, you know, obviously there needs to be a conversation about balancing out some of this. And I mean, there's another challenge here, which is. North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware are all expanding aquaculture and they're all targeting individual oyster <coughs> culture. And so we need to, yeah, it, it goes farther. I just didn't want to name all the, every, every body of water. And so, you know, it comes down to things like, night, like, like marketing and identifying alternative marketing, you know, solutions, alternative places for these oysters to go. And there's a number of people working on projects like that, discussing that, looking at a shuck market, trying to do that. But, you know, these are people that I think are kind of seeing the, the future, seeing where things are going and trying to, trying to identify solutions. To us, that's what this whole thing is about. If three people have good ideas, imagine the good ideas we can get from this entire room with this incredible legacy and history of shellfishing, which I'm smiling because it's 100% true. Sometimes you're not the easiest people to work with, but you're, you're good people and you know a lot about shellfishing, I'll tell you that much. And uh, no, I mean, it's, it is, it's, it's, it's a challenge, but it's not just nitrogen mitigation oysters that are gonna, are, are gonna have an impact on your price point. 
And you know what? I see a lot more people growing quahogs now, but they're taking three years to get there. Let's, you know, let's talk about that. As a state, it's not sustainable to be a monoculture, and we are a monoculture. We grow more oysters than anything else. And you know, those kind of things, I'm not, no one needs to change their identity, but we need to at least have options to deal with this. These are so foreseeable problems. They're clear as day, and I don't see any real you know, action happening. And a lot of you call me and talk to me about these problems. And, you know, I, you know, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but honestly, it, you know, I know some of these things are real and tangible and important to you people. We didn't just make up this stuff. Okay, questions? Jude. Thank you, Madam Chair. And could you um, introduce yourself? Jude Ahern, just a recreational shellfisher person when Nancy gives me my license. Um, Chris, I specifically want to thank you from the state for coming. And I want to say hello to Angela Pacini, who will be watching this video from the Secretary of State's office. Because what I'm most concerned about, just as a citizen, not someone who's a grower, is there is actually very little transparency with this group. And Scott, specifically, you said you're the recording secretary. Well, in the assessment committee, which was not recorded, um, officially, uh, and Chris, I think, was open to recording those, mo those uh, meetings. Yeah. Um, I asked on the 1st of February if they would be. You dodged the question. I asked it again, and then you said no. Then on the 6th of February, the assessment committee got together and said, you know, we feel there's a lack of transparency. Someone talked about getting it recorded. Um, nothing happened. On the 11th, you again said no. On the 12th, I emailed Chris and you know, said you didn't have to respond, but really demand it from you because your story keeps changing. And there are too many discrepancies to get into and bore anyone, <laughs> but there are so many. Um, and what's different about Wellfleet, unlike Chatham that thought this came from outer space, is that our shellfish constable worked for the Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance, and the state does have a tool for conflict of interest. It's called a 23B3 form that I have asked Nancy for a year and a half to sign with her relationship with SPAT and with Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance, and our board of selectmen has not forced that issue. I've called the ethics board with the state, Jerry there. He'll be listening to this too. Um, and he explained to me that usually it's not the appointing authority that requires these 23B3s. It comes from the employee herself to protect herself. And it's the simplest form. It's not about finances. It's just about your relationship. For instance, when Nancy and Melissa went to Washington State together, you know, I'd like to hear about that. So to hear that the wealth fleet was forgotten when Nancy worked for your company is, is a lie. I will clarify that Nancy did not go to Washington with me. Uh, sure, how would you like me to prove it? Extensives, who you met with, things like that. You certainly yeah. came back and talked to her, right, to share information? So, sure, I can attempt to, to do that. The, I was out there in Washington three, four years ago at this point. Um, as a consultant for another fishing organization, helping them with their strategic plan. The Fishing Co Communities Coalition, which is a, a group of organizations around the country that represent small boat fishermen, like the <coughs> Fisherman's Alliance, and we work on federal policy issues. And I personally took a couple extra days down there to learn about shellfish in Washington. And yes, I reported back to the organization that what I learned Sure, Nancy was part of that. But it's not the point. Fair enough. Okay. There. I mean, um, if if you have a question, Jude, I think we need to be at full. Let's. Yeah, we need to stick to the agenda, and. Uh, excuse me, Jude, I, I can't understand what you're saying from the back of the room. And then okay. you need so to keep it so brief. There's so many discrepancies. Like you say, it's not about maximizing. Can you put up the NOAA slide that says it's about maximizing? Okay. 
That's yeah Noah's. about increasing shellfish in the water. It's got that big Noah oh, I know what you're logo. About. Yeah. So you say it's not about that, but it is about that. So for Noah, it may be about that. For and Noah is you. No, come on. Noah's Noah is not lurking. Me. Okay, Noah's very involved. The blue economy. Let's talk about that. I mean, they're for the whole 208 thing. You're all so close. That's the problem. All right, I'm going to recognize. Who am I recognizing? My name is Wayne Clough. I am a recreational shellfish person. Been coming here since 1987. I have to commend Nancy and her staff on a great job that they've done in keeping our beds, uh, giving me the ability to go out and get some exercise and get my 10, 10 quarts a week when I, when I have the time. Two, one thing I just wanted to add to that you might want to consider, every one of these harbors has, typically has a marina, which has fuel tanks. We have fuel tanks that are almost to the end of their useful life. And if one were to leak, I'm sure the that would be far worse than nitrates to any, and cost a lot more to clean up for the federal government and the state. Uh, we are looking to replace those. I called the state. There is a program with the state that will reimburse us for 50% of all the costs of removal and replacement of those tanks. What happened is in 19, excuse me, 2009, the recession hit. So the program's there, ready to run, ready to fund us, but there's no money. So once you get your money for the labs, <laughs> I suggest you, you know, work to try to get some money for these fuel pumps too. Um, and in, in addition, he said that he would be willing, willing to participate in any program, the guy that runs the program for the state. Strangely enough, it's the Department of Revenue uh, that runs the program. The program for commercial people, people that own buildings, people that own homes, if you have a tank leak in your house, fully funded, but nothing <clears throat> Nothing for the towns. Uh, in addition, if there's anything you can do to help us get the federal government to live up to their obligation to help us uh, dredge the harbor, the $5 billion, so that we can spend our money to finish it, that would be helpful also. So I think that should be added to your initiatives. Thank you, All right. Are we ready to wrap this up? Does anyone else have an important question or a point that they would like? I got three um, more. Dave? Three more. Oh, okay. Hey. All right. All right. You gotta, so uh, you gotta... I'll, just, I'll just like bang them all out. Like, bang them quick. out. So the, when I first asked what does the MSI do for me as an individual, I was going to ask, so what does the MSI do for the Nature Conservancy, the Alliance, and the MA? Well, I know what it does for the MAA now. But what does it do, do I guess, specifically for you two? Like, you, just because we've gone. It was, I was a four-point question. Yep. Um, I'll start with that. Uh, for the, the Alliance, our interest in shellfish is twofold. Our membership um, has a lot of fishermen that depend on wild harvest of shellfish to fill out their year. Um, and secondly, we are investors in ARC. So we have a, a skin in the game to make sure that shellfishing remains sustainable in our state, right? And we, we don't see ourselves as the expert that's gonna solve that problem, but we feel like MSI is a good process for getting people in the room to help identify those solutions so that we, we can remain sustainable and that our fishermen can keep fishing. Yeah, for the, for the Nature Conservancy, again, just as a conservation organization, we're in the shellfish space, we're interested at the Again, we're an international organization. We're interested in providing food and water sustainably to communities, having properly functioning coastal ecosystems that support the communities and support um, support those natural systems. So, you know, what we hope to get out of this are things that drive toward those goals. But we do that in a way that we want to be supportive to municipalities, communities, and the people involved. And so that, you know, one of the things that, or two things about the Nature Conservancy is one, we're a science-based organization. And, you know, when we're dealing with policy issues, whether it's at the local or federal level uh, or beyond, that it's, it's really meant to be in a non-confrontational way where people like Conservation Law Foundation will sue someone else to get what they want. The Nature Conservancy looks to partner with 
people and communities to try and find the common goals. And so that's why we think that this is a good opportunity to do that. Cool. Thanks. Did you have another question? Nah. No. <laughs> I have a um, question, Bob. Oh, oh, Jim, and then I'm going to take the gentleman at the podium. Jim? Oh, go ahead. Nathan Davis, 15th generation, Well, Felician. Um, with the 208 wastewater program, the state has about uh, what five billion dollars earmarked, most of which is going to be from the air nub tax, 2.75 percent tax. Um, so, how does the MSI plan on getting this money, trans using it, and being uh, transparent with it? I mean, I don't, I don't know anything about the money or any. You know, don't know anything about the money. I, I mean, I don't personally don't know anything about the air nub tax and no, the 208 I, plan. And all the I know about the 208 plan, but I don't know. You about don't know the about tax. the money involved. No, but I don't. when the money is involved and when it's earmarked, where is it going to go? How's it going to be with the private private partnership? How's it? Where's the transparency going to come from? I, I, there's been no discussion of the MSI task force pursuing additional funds like that. I honestly, I. If, other people can speak to it, but DMF hasn't heard anything about it. A lot that. of us have a lot of problems with public-private partnerships. We see them as government-sanctioned monopolies, and that's what a lot of the people here are in this room for. And with these private-public partnerships, there's just no transparency. So when the money comes rolling in, what's to prevent it from being a slush fund with all of the private partnerships? Good agencies, good legislators, good executive branch that understands the needs of the constituents. But if we're starting with not even using open meeting laws, how are we going to? I think we've been working on trying to fix that and listening to what folks like you have been saying. I, honestly, the division took a larger role specifically because of that. And you know, we want to bring transparency. Jeff Kennedy is running the assessment committee. And that's, man that's, that's you know, that's, that, that committee is the one doing the work. And that's what I think is really important for, you're on that committee. Mm -hmm. And, you know, th that's the entirety of that work is, is, is your comments on that document. I, we get what you're saying. Mm -hmm. It's not lost on us. We're, we're, we want to do what it takes to, to, to make sure that you're comfortable with at least having this discussion. All right. So do you think we could have a little bit more information? Maybe absolutely. The next yeah, towards absolutely. Towards this subject? Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Ellen, you want another chance? And then we're going to no, got to wind it up. It's getting late. I'm going to answer the question. So, um, Mr. Davis, okay. to answer your question, um, the town, the right. town is going, I'm on the select board, so that's why I'm answering it. The town is going to have a warrant article, pretty sure. We just got the correspondence about this yesterday or the day before. And the town's going to decide what to do with that money. I'm talking to you, but I'm going to turn my back to you. Right. Because, yeah. In other words, this isn't going to go to the MSI. The town has to get the warrant article on this year's annual town meeting warrant. But we're going to decide what to use it for. And it has to be to address wastewater issues. So MSI isn't going to touch our money. Right. That's great. <laughs> and, and it doesn't have any intent of doing so, and it, it doesn't have any intent of telling you how you should do your 208 plan, right? Jim, you had one more question? Yeah, I just wanted to speak on conflict of interest. I think that kind of thing can go on. I mean, you can potentially have a conflict and step up to the plate and not benefit personally in one way, shape, or form. It can happen. Um, maybe some of the things that have gone on to date look like there's some funny things going on in the background, as the gentleman <coughs> kind of alluded to. However, I think there's enough. And if for whatever reason that there's something going on, it's obviously there's too much light on the situation. It'll come to light. So, you know, I mean, I've been told that I have all kinds of conflicts of interest. Well. Tough shit. <laughs> yes. No, really. I mean, who do you want on a shellfish board? I mean, it's nice to have, I mean, for years we tried to get people who had nothing to do with shellfish. It's not that easy. <laughs> no, that's, you just want a different view of it. But it's important to have people like these guys and this new young fella over there and that one. That's important. But it's possible that 
we, we act on things that look at the big picture. And we're not a self-centered group of people who don't give a shit. At least I, I'm speaking for myself, and I, I think we have a, a very good board. I think when Helen was on the board and Barbara Bressenall, I mean, I think people care. You know, people give up their time. You know, I, we talked about the dog regulations for three hours. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. Yeah, so... Yeah. I think that was totally ridiculous, quite frankly. <laughs> However, you, you can look as though you have a conflict and, and not act on it where you benefit. Now, there are some situations that I think in town here where there are. And I think over time, there's too much media and too, much people, too many people paying attention to things like that where it'll come to the surface and it'll be addressed. Everybody's opinion matters these days, Jim. That's the problem. Everybody's opinion matters and it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't weed itself out. Everybody just kept their mouth shut and let it weed itself out. The problem would solve itself a lot of times. And will say well, you crazy. also have to have the gumption to say something. Well, okay. we've, been, we've been soliciting feedback before this and I think it's really important to know that, that you know, people have been coming to us with these ideas since government was created and organizations were created. We're looking for your opinion and for your voice. This is exact, this is the process. Right here, right this second. This is the process. I have a question. Yeah, uh, uh, Brad, well, excuse me. I, I, I'm, ha I'm having a, uh, I can't think of your name for time. I'm, I'm sorry. Hi, uh, Craig Pussy, I live, live in Orleans. Um, I'm on the Orleans uh, Waterways and Shellfish Advisory Board. And for the last two years, we've been, um, last three years, we've been in the middle of our uh, nitrogen mitigation project in Lyons Pond. And for the last two years, the oysters that we've gotten rid of never went to the market. I've heard three people make comments that. Um, Craig, I'm gonna stop you there because that's not true. Say what? It's not true. What's that? That a, a large portion of those oysters went to Falmouth and then were commercially harvested. They were traded yep, at Falmouth. That's correct. The rest, of them went, the rest of them went to the Pleasant Bay for put and take. Some of them went off Route 28 for recreational fisheries, but yes, Falmouth traded seed for Orleans adult oysters, and then Falmouth had a commercial fishery, um, put those into the commercial okay. fishery. So they so did end up that. in a commercial okay. fishery. But um, some of them came. So a lot of them didn't. And the, there was a lot of concern that those oysters are going right to a commercial mar market, which they weren't. So. Brad, and then we're going to have to wind this up. We'll, we'll, we'll try to adjourn this meeting, I think, at 9.30. Everybody looks I'm Br I'm like... Brad Morris. I know everybody's getting tired. It's late. And it's, um, thank you guys for coming. And uh, I'm a little bit concerned, nervous, whatever. I, you know, I'm a small grower. I, I want to stay small and keep it all. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to have to get big to sell 8 million oysters at 40 cents to make a living. But... I was a, I'm a displaced sea clammer. And, and uh, you know, basically, I, I went in 1987 in front of a board just like this, and they said, we want public input on sea clams. And we said, and they said, we're going to go to ITQs. Just long story short, they went to ITQs, didn't really listen to anything we said, that, and if we weren't a boat owner, it basically put us out of business. And I helped them by being stupid, helped them put myself out of business by not adhering to the laws they made. And I just, when I see a, a group like this, and I don't know what it is, and I get scared of people that aren't in my business getting in my business, even though my business isn't that big of a deal because it's so small. So I just beg of you to, to keep that in mind, you know, going forward with this, that we have a small way of life here that we just, I, I just... The last thing I want to say, it's just a comment. I, I just, somebody that has a hatchery, somebody that has a wholesale business, somebody that's growing them and that has all phases of it scares me. Yeah. And, and having that power to say, you know, the hell with Joe six pack down there that's got 20 bags this week. Because right? it's already happening. That's all I wanted to say, you know. Yeah. Already happening. All right. Are there any more? Uh, oh, Jenny. You. Um, Melissa, can you just clarify the city's facilities and mostly on the task force? And I know I asked that question 
based on the budget now that association is solving? Is that who are you seeking? Is that still part of I put that back to our conversation because of the Wealth Fleet self so I would put that back on Wellfleet and ask you guys who you'd like to, to represent you at the task force. Ginny, I thought you were on the task force. Uh, on the assessment committee. committee. On the assessment committee. Mike. Gin, yeah. Um, Ginny Parker, the question that I just asked um, Melissa that she just answered, in East Ham, I asked her, she mentioned that the, somebody asked why the Cape Cod Fishermen's Alliance was on the task force and there wasn't any other fishermen represented. And she said, because they're the only fishermen's association on the Cape. And I explained to her that we had just started the Wellfleet Shell Fishermen's Association and that East Ham and Orleans are also starting one and that together we're forming a collaborative. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that your comment was relative to my comment and that it would be somebody, if not from the association, then appropriately picked that we can all agree on. So, all right. So, so how, I, how will we go about that? Um, Picking this person for the association. We should talk about it in the next association meeting and then we'll talk, maybe we'll come to your board. Does that? And, and then we can recommend to Melissa somebody from the, the association that we all decide we would like to represent us. Is that, I'm just trying to figure this out. Is this how this right. would that go? That would go. I have somebody, I have a thought in mind. Somebody, somebody who okay. telecommuted to the meeting the other day, so. Sounds good. Yeah. Um, Mikey? I just Michael? Have, yeah, I just have a comment about the nitrogen You're gonna introduce yeah, yourself, so. Michael DeVasto, I'm a shelf fisherman um, and grant holder. And uh, I, I just was, it was brought up earlier about the potential for them not being removed and Anybody who thinks that there's going to be towns all over Cape looking for solutions to reduce their um, cost uh, of nitrogen mitigation through shell fishing, um, and we're talking about a lot of towns putting a lot of oysters in the water, that those aren't going to enter the market or need to be removed from the water is crazy. Because an oyster is going to remove nitrogen, yeah, but if you have a mass die off, and we know there's dermo everywhere, you know? Nitrogen is going to go back, <laughs> and uh, so I just—it's something that we're all wary of, and I think we should be, because as growers, that's—it's unsustainable for the market to handle the amount of oysters that would be used to mitigate the nitrogen in any effective way, you know. And you, it's like—it's not so much wealthy. Wealthy's got a lot of oysters in the water, but other towns, we don't have any control over that. And so it's important through MSI, I think, to be involved in that conversation because those towns are going to be moving forward and they don't care about our influence or whatever, like coming from just this town, you know? And it's towns that don't have a shellfish industry also. Like, and so I just want to put that out there. I um, mean, we're talking about like potentially billions of oysters and yeah. So anyways, I just want to put that out there and, and have everyone think about it, I guess. <laughs> Nightmares. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so it's 9.30 now. Um, is there anyone else that has something really important they want to ask that's directly related to MSI, or are we going to? It's over, Barbara. Um, Chris, I'm sorry. Chris is our last okay, question. Last one. Last one. Hi, Chris Merle. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, Scott, I'd like to ask you what the membership of the MAA is. How many members? I have wanted to know that too. I can't give you the exact number, but it typically Rough. ranges from year to year to somewhere between 80 and 95. So 80 and 95, and of, of those members, how many are growers, roughly? I can't tell you that, I don't know. I just, I, I, my main problem with the, this, the whole, this whole initiative is the fact that you guys put that proposal forward. And I, I really think that that should be taken off the table because I think it puts a negative impact on what the group is trying to do overall. And to put a proposal that like that forward, say say you're representing 50 growers. I mean, there's more than that just in this town. Yeah, just and just, to be, just to be clear, as as Chris mentioned, that proposal would have likely gone forward. I think would have definitely gone forward regardless of MSI. 
Yes. Uh, the reason it went forward is because there's been long-standing challenges now to uh, growers in different towns about their ability to transfer leases, if at all. That's not true in every town. Right. And what the proposed language does is it doesn't remove the approval process from any of the towns. So I, I would encourage folks to really read the legislation that was proposed because ultimately it was really intended to be a conversation starter, which it definitely has done. Right. It's trying to get it to ultimately get at what will work for the towns. 25 bucks per acre for year, per year, as an example, legislatively driven in Chapter 130. Should that number be increased? Uh, or is it, are the towns happy with what they're getting from aquaculture the now? The towns and town of Welby has done very well over the last I, 150 years with its system now. There I, is no reason to change it to put big, big business in the business of the selfish And that's not, with due respect, that's not the intent of this. It doesn't matter what the intent is, my dear. There's a difference. I, I think I think people are upset because they, they there wasn't outreach on that issue. You're looking to change a statewide leasing uh, and transferability, and I really think there should have been some outreach before you put that forward because that makes the MAA yep. only representing so such a small number of people look very well the um, out for themselves. Yeah, and the, the other and the other part of it was that we are the legislative process is a two-year process. We are at the beginning of a new two-year process. So again, if it wasn't proposed even to have the conversation, it was going to be another two years before it even came up for conversation. Well, I'm glad we're that's, talking so about that's, it. That's <laughs> so now we're talking about it. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that we have a sign-in sheet. If you'd like to be included to, you know, keep in, so we can keep in touch with everybody that was here. Um, if you could seek out that sign-in sheet so we'll know where you're, you know, I don't know if it continued to get passed around. Does anyone know where the sign-out sheet is? Okay, good. Just make sure you make sure somebody sign people sign it. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it.